Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 42nd Annual School Health Conference, our first attempt at having it live stream versus in person. We wanna welcome you all back. I'm Angie Knoxted. I am the uh, program manager for our health literacy and nursing bioethics program here at Children's Mercy, as well as being the co-director of our certificate program in pediatric bioethics. However, I know many of you from the last 22 years where we have been involved in this school health conference, where I worked in education, and I am still currently the nurse planner for this program. Um, I do have some exciting news to share with you a little later in our welcome here. But first I wanna welcome everyone from all over Kansas and Missouri and even a couple of folks that are out of state. We have about 300 folks registered today and I hope it's a great morning for you as we catch up on our usual um, get ready to go back to school, whatever that means at this time this year. But we are excited that you're joining us and hope you'll um, enjoy the morning. First of all, we do need you to sign in and uh, register your attendance online. You see a QR code sitting here. If you want to, you can take your cell phone and turn on your camera and scan that code and it will take you directly to it. Or you can go into the chat area where we have the QR code and a web link that you can click on. Please fill out all of that information is because we can get your full attendance, but also it gives us the email you'd like to receive your evaluation from. Just a little history before I go into the disclosures. For those of you that are new to the School Health Conference, I said it is the 42nd annual and that is true. To give you a little history, for the first 20 years, there was a group of school nurses throughout the Kansas City metro area that worked with folks from the health department in Kansas City, Missouri, and a group called Mohawka that came together to say, we need some education, some continuing education for nurses throughout the metro area. And they started that program 42 years ago. With that, they would go from high, each year, go to a different high school and have their program. I became involved in their 15th or 16th annual conference when I began to provide CE through Children's Mercy for that, for the nurses attending. And then on, in 1998, it was determined, or actually at the 1997 conference, that Mohawka was no longer had the funds or the resources to pro, uh, provide that program. So Children's Mercy, I went back to them and we got permission. And since the last 22 years, we've been providing this conference for school nurses. So I hope you do enjoy your day. As this is our vir first virtual, there will be some things that will be different. One is you can't talk in person to the planning committee, each other, um, maybe by chat, but hopefully you'll be listening to the speaker. But, um, but also that networking that we started with our staff here at Children's Mercy that many of you consult or ask questions of. Our hands-on interactive and community resource exhibits won't be available, but I did wanna let you know, many of them sent in one-page resource pages that we will put up on the website that you'll hear about more later so that you can still have some of the information and resources they have available to you. So with that, let's get on with the business with some housekeeping. First of all, as you know, for education, we have to disclose some information to you. Today, to receive your 3.25 contact hours, you will need to sign in via the online link, attend the entire program, and then complete a post online electronic evaluation, which will be sent to you next week on Monday. We're giving you the weekend off. You can think about the conference and plan your registration or your evaluation responses, but we will be sending that out next week on Monday. Also, uh, the Children's Mercy, uh, of course, is providing the continuing education. Just a little update, we received a distinction as a provider uh, approved with distinction to provide you these contact hours today. Lastly, there are no conflicts of interest that were identified by any of the planners or any of our presenters that'll be talking with you today. Here is our schedule. Thank you for seeing your email that we moved back due to technology purposes so that you only have to log in once to the link, through the link. But for what we're gonna do until um, 8.30 is just have some welcome, give you some information that will be helpful from Children's Mercy in the future, as well as um, I get to make a really nice announcement real quickly here. Then we will go on and have our first presentation at 8.30 with, uh, on asthma followed by a diabetes presentation. And then we'll have question and answer session for both those two speakers. You can send your questions in through the chat bot area. Just type those in and my colleague will be reading those off and the speakers can answer your question. Then we're gonna give you a little 15 minute break just like we usually would, where you can get up, go get another cup of coffee, whatever you need to do. But please come back at 10.30, come back, keep your computer on, come back online, and we will have a panel that will address COVID issues related to children. 
we will have a speaker talk about the actual disease process and impact on children and what's new. And then we'll followed by a mental health speaker who will talk about how we help families and kids cope. And then we'll have an actual one of your fellow colleague school nurses will present on what's going on and as you all know what's going on, but what's going on in her school district and share that with you. So just a couple of things before I make our quick announcement here is that you will get 3.25 contact hours, but in order to do that, make sure you sign in on that chat box, that red cap survey. Also attend the entire conference and then complete the online post-conference evaluation that will be sent to you via your email by the 21st of August. The email will be sent to you via Children's Mer via Survey Monkey, but it will say, have CMH Education Department in that email link. Make sure you fill that out and send that back. As we get ready to go to the next slide, I would like to introduce and announce to all of you that we have a new school health program manager who um, I am so excited to work with that will be working throughout the year on school health issues, but also work with me, uh, me to help provide this conference for you annually. I'll still be helping out to provide the CE, but my colleague, Athena Mena, will be joining us here right now to give you some more information. And Athenas comes to us from the Environmental Health Program and also is a partner with me on the Health Literacy Committee here at Children's Mercy. She's a very exciting person to work with as well as resourceful and um, knows a lot technology a lot better than I do. So with that, Athenas, I'd love for you to go on and tell about some things we have available to the school nurses. Hi everyone, again, my name is Athena Smena. You may remember me from the last webinar that we had on school reentry and COVID-19. And so I just wanted to share with you all some of the updated resources that we have available on our website. I'll also try to navigate the website and we'll see if I'm really as tech savvy as, as Angie just said. But on your screen, you will find the School Health website. It provides school health support, so it's meant for our school nurses, school health professionals, and we do provide you with information to COVID-19 and the resources that have just recently been developed. As listed on there, we have recommendations for a safe return to sports and physical activity that was produced by our sports medicine team. We also have like quick little videos on how how to properly put on a mask, how to properly take it off. And I like them because they're pretty easy step-by-step. Step. They kept it very simple. We've also been able to produce at Children's Mercy a mask, well, a how to wear a mask properly uh, educational tool or resource PDF form. And I have seen it used throughout the hospital as for signage, for reminders to people, because sometimes you'll see some people that maybe wear the mask right below, below their nose or they have it hanging off to their side on the ear. And that may be beneficial to be able to share with your families or have it at your, at your schools throughout for signage in the bathrooms or in the hallways. We also have uh, recommendations on how to properly disinfect and our environmental health specialist, Lou Gard, developed a list of those disinfectants. Not all disinfectants are the same. So these really help provide you with the ones that from what research has told us has been able to been very beneficial and effective against COVID-19. The last but Certainly not least and most recently developed is the school reopening guidelines. Children's Mercy's team was able to develop these guidelines based off of CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, and in collaboration with the, uh, different partners throughout the state of Missouri. We really wanted to focus on risk mitigation strategies that will help reduce the risk of exposure while uh, in the school for both staff and for students. I highly recommend if you haven't already taken a look at it to definitely uh, review it, speak with your school leaders and COVID-19 task forces to really then consider if your guidelines are matching up or if you have any questions, even after reviewing all of our materials we do have the COVID-19 school assistance request link that's available on our website. This request link is available for you to submit any questions, requests. We've had even uh, some school district leaders send us their plans 
for a review. And we, we've been able to get back with everyone pretty promptly within one to three days. And so if you have any questions, again, I highly encourage you using this web link. It really helps us funnel all the questions and gets us to be able to promptly provide you the information you need. And there also are other resources available that are outside of COVID-19 on our school health support page. Uh, we currently have a Shayla Sullivan. She is a provider here at Children's Mercy who wants to start kicking up again some more sessions with families on Prepped and Ready, which helps provide information about suicide prevention, learning the signs, and then also just general safety tips to consider while being at home. And we've all been at home a lot more often. So if you are interested in learning more or would like to share that information with your families, please feel free to reach out to me or to Shayla Sullivan at Children's Mercy. And on the web link, we'll also have our school health conference recording where you will be able to review all of our slides again and be able to take a look at the information we've shared along with some resource pages that have been able to been, de um, been developed from Children's Mercy for your viewing and for your benefit. We rely a lot on kids' health because it's very health literate. It provides information for parents and for children. So we definitely have a link for that as well and our community outreach portal. If you're not familiar with the community outreach portal, what it is for is that Children's Mercy is currently involved with different events or workshops, trainings, conferences. If there is any interest of pulling someone from Children's Mercy to come to any event that you are planning to host or that you know your school district community is hosting, this is the this is the site that I would recommend you go to. It will take you to a form that has a, several questions just to make sure that we have your correct contact information, understand the purpose of the event, and what exactly you need. If it's about physical activity, or is it about safety, or is it about some sort of training for the nurses? If you are able to provide us with all of that information, then we will be able to determine who will be the best people to staff that event, and we will let you know if we will be able to help with it. All right, so here's where I'm gonna to try to, and sorry, uh, Darian up there, he had already left the link open for me, but here we go. We are on the school health support webpage, and I really just wanted to show you, it's very easy to access. If you don't have this direct link, you can just go to childrensmercy.org and go to in the community. Off to the side, uh, it will say school health support, and that's how you will be able to access this webpage. Off to the right, you will notice that we have a list of different services and general educational information that would be beneficial for school district leaders and school health professionals to review. There's information about asthma, along with diabetes, multidisciplinary uh, food allergens, and then also other services that are involved with schools, such as like the Red Card Bullying Prevention Campaign. If you're not familiar with it, they are they have gone around to different school districts, especially in the Kansas City, Kansas, and some Kansas City, Missouri school districts, and have been able to provide education on how to prevent bullying and promote safety in the in the schools. COVID-19 school reentry resources. This is the important section that I wanted to share with you where it's returning to school and community safely. You will be able to find the guidance that was just developed and you just access it by clicking on read the guidebook. Below here are the different resources that I had just mentioned earlier. And on request a consultation is where you will be able to find the COVID-19 school assistance uh, request link. Then as you continue to scroll down on the school health support page, we have the information for the school health conference. This is where you will be able to find the recording along with the resource information that we will be able to provide for you and the community outreach portal link where you will be able to submit any requests for, uh, for us to attend your event. And below are just more educational resources and information that we feel would be beneficial for you all. And I believe you can now see the slide, so yay. 
and I will go ahead and move on forward. But I really wanted to show you the web page so you so it's easy to navigate and you can know where all of our resources are located. Here is just a slide of more information about the prepped and ready uh, information that Shayla Sullivan is able to provide for parents. It's really dedicated for them. It allows them to have an opportunity to ask questions. It's just a virtual one hour uh, webinar that she hosts and she's planning to do it uh, at least once a month moving forward. Lastly, I just wanted to list out additional resources that Children's Mercy has relied on heavily. Of course, this list could be 10 times longer, but we just really wanted to hone in and focus on the main ones that we, uh, we used often and we continue to refer to. But that is all I have, and I'll go ahead and bring it back to Angie so she can transition on to our next presenters. Thank you. Thanks, Athenis. This is um, our beginning. And if you have any other information, just go out to that school health support site and it'll get you more information and connect us to us. So our next speaker, our first speaker actually, is going to be Misty Smith, who is a nurse practitioner in our allergy, asthma, and immunology program. She is going to talk with you about asthma management in the school setting and give you an update on some of the things that are going on, especially as we have COVID on top of our asthma. But she is here. She, I'm gonna let her introduce more about um, herself to you, but I'm so excited that she was able to join us today because we know that asthma and diabetes, two of our clinical topics, are two of our chronic illnesses and kids we see in the schools, but also with COVID-19 puts them at a little more risk. So thank you. And Misty, you're on. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Misty Smith. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner in the allergy, asthma, sorry about that, <laughs> allergy, asthma, and immunology division. And I have been a nurse practitioner. I'm fairly new. I started in September, um, but previous to that, I was in the allergy as a nurse. So I kind of had built my experience um, as a nurse and then came on as a nurse practitioner. So today I will be speaking to you as a school nurse and talking about asthma, as well as the management of asthma in the school setting. So what you will learn today, um, you will be able to identify asthma symptoms and triggers and you'll be able to understand, have a basic understanding of the controller reliever, which is uh, the most important, which you will be utilizing in um, your setting, and uh, prednisone for medication treatment. You'll also be able to explain the nurse role as well as the student role when it comes to treating asthma. And you'll be able to assist your students with the proper use of the inhalers and spacers um, as well as if they use nebulizers in your setting. So I wanted to start with some asthma statistics uh, for childhood asthma. So in the United States, children who have asthma account for 7.5% of the population. In 2018, there were 192 childhood deaths related to asthma. And of those with asthma in 2018, almost 3 million children had an asthma attack. In 2016, childhood asthma accounted for approximately 80,000 inpatient hospital stays, nearly 550 ER visits, and close to 2.5 million office visits. The leading cause of chronic disease related to absenteeism in, is childhood asthma. Greater than 10 million student days are missed every year, which leads to lower academic performance. So I first wanna kind of show what's going on with asthma and comparing it with the normal airways. So as you can see on the left here, those are the normal airways. They're open, breathing is easy, air can get in and out. On the right hand side shows what the pathophysiology that's going on with asthma. So we have inflammation in the bronchial linings. We also have mucus buildup. And then we also have the tightening of the muscles around those airways. And so that makes it really difficult to get air in and out, and it traps the air in the alveoli, which causes the symptoms. So asthma symptoms, the most commonly seen, um, and which may be the only symptom in children is cough. Other symptoms include wheezing, which is the whistling sound, shortness of breath, 
rapid breathing, chest tightness, which most kids will explain is their chest hurts or it feels funny. Uh, they have difficulty with physical activity because of their symptoms, as well as difficulty with sleeping. So triggers, this is something that um, you as a school nurse would want to uh, be cognizant of and to kind of know what triggers there are for your asthma students. So we have mold, pet dander, dust mites, colds, strong smells, pollen, cockroaches, weather, smoke, and exercise. So I'm gonna first start by talking about the how the triggers are categorized into allergic and non-allergic. So the allergic are of course the pollens, trees, grasses, weeds, molds, dust mites, pet dander, which is most commonly dog and cat, although there can be rabbit, rat, other types of pet dander, um, and also cockroach. The non-allergic include the smoke, pollution, cold air, change in weather, emotions such as laughing or crying. So I wanna talk a little bit more about exercise-induced asthma, especially because being a school nurse, you will encounter this uh, with uh, recess and physical education, PE, that kind of thing. So these students will experience symptoms within five to 20 minutes of exercise or the physical activity. So what we wanna do with them is make sure that we can diagnose them and treat them and uh, to maximize their ability to exercise. We don't wanna um, prevent them from being able to do exercise. So treatment uh, is another important aspect and that is using the quick reliever. And we actually recommend doing it 15 minutes before the exercise that will actually uh, set them up for success to do the activity. Other things for them to keep in mind is drinking plenty of fluids when they're doing their activities. And then if they do have symptoms that they stop and rest and take their uh, quick reliever. Also uh, cooling down at the end of their exercise. So a couple other triggers that I wanna talk about, classroom pets, although I don't know that they're as common anymore, um, but if they are in your classroom, um, first of all, encouraging the no pet policy is probably the best because not only asthma, but allergies can be an issue. So if it's not possible, keeping them in their cage as often as possible, keeping them away from ventilation systems so that the dander is not getting to other areas of the school, regularly cleaning their cages, locating students that are sensitive furthest away from the animals as well as their habitat. Also avoiding the animal coming in contact with carpets, upholstered furniture, stuffed toys and pillows. So dust mites. Dust mites are found in carpet, upholstered furniture, other fabric containing items like stuffed toys or animals and pillows. Um, so just kind of being aware if you have these things in your classroom. So prevention includes removing uh, and cleaning up the dust frequently, but using a damp cloth versus dry. Uh, vacuuming carpets and fabric, which uh, is covered furniture frequently. Um, also washing stuffed toys, pillows frequently in hot water. So another trigger is uh, mold. So the mold is formed obviously with moisture and water. So some examples include water leaks, standing water, water stains. Um, so the biggest thing with prevention here is identifying those and also immediately addressing it. So taking care of the issue uh, when it's identified. Also kind of identifying the source of moisture or water. So if you notice wheat leaks, standing water or stains to make sure that those are taken care of right away. The other thing is to, uh, once you identify moisture or wet areas to make sure that they're dry within 24 to 48 hours. So another uh, trigger are irritants that can be found in the classroom. So irritants may include chalk, strong spelling markers, cleaning agents, air fresheners, and paint. So all of these can be irritants and cause uh, asthma to be triggered. So prevention just includes trying to minimize the use of them during school hours and also being aware of those who are sensitive to these uh, triggers or irritants and to make accommodations for that. 
So asthma severity, so this is kind of important to know um, where your students are um, and kind of know it, where their treatment level is. And we'll talk about an asthma action plan here in just a minute and I'll go through what that means and the importance of it. So their symptoms here, the biggest thing is if they have symptoms more than twice a week that they need to advance their treatment from what they are doing daily. So this just kind of categorizes by um, the classification, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. The other way to categorize uh, the asthma, whether it's controlled or not controlled, is the rules of two. So um, asking, do you use a quick reliever inhaler more than two times a week? Do you wake up at night with asthma symptoms more than two times a month? And do you refill your asthma prescription more than two times a year? So our overall treatment goals are to prevent asthma exacerbations or prevent the symptoms, um, minimizing the progression of asthma or their asthma worsening, optimal symptom management, so making sure that the symptoms are treated when they occur, and also avoiding medication adverse side effects. Participating in physical activities, like I said before, we wanna make sure that we have our students that are getting active and they're, they're able to do PE and sports, things like that with minimal to no symptoms. Also, we want them to be able to sleep at night uh, without symptoms, because as we know, if they're waking up, it interferes with their sleep, which then can interfere with their ability to focus during school. So this is a picture of different controllers that are out there, there are several. Um, it depends on the severity of the asthma, the situation, it depends on what, um, which medication works better for that particular student. Um, so these are just different ones that the students will be using daily. Uh, this is additional inhalers that are controllers that are also used daily. Um, there's different dry powders, combination therapies, that kind of thing. So controller inhalers really are used uh, one to two times a day and they're used for long-term control. So what they do is they actually help prevent the inflammation and mucus buildup down inside those little airways. So over time, which is why they're used daily, is how they do that. Now, some kids don't necessarily need this daily. They may have an intermittent plan, but most of the time when they have asthma, they'll have a daily medication. So some examples are inhaled corticosteroid meter dose, and those are Flovent, Qvar, Asmonex, Alvesco. Some of the dry powder inhaled corticosteroids are like the asthma, twist haler, pulmacort, flex haler, Flovent, discus, and Arnuti Lipta. The combination inhalers are Advair, Air Duo, Respiclic, Brio, Elipta, Dolera, and Simicort. So as you can see, there's several different <laughs> inhalers out there. Um, so oral steroids, these are used when we have, um, when the students like, that they have severe asthma exacerbations. So when they're following their asthma action plan and their treatment is not working and they continue to get worse and worse, uh, we will start them on the oral steroids. And the purpose of that is that they need something that's systemic versus directly to the lungs to help them speed recovery from asthma, their asthma exacerbation. This will also help prevent the symptoms from recurring as well as the worsening of symptoms. So these are what you will be most familiar and most uh, mostly seeing in your setting. So the quick reliever or also called the rescue inhaler. So this will be used, it's a fast acting bronchodilator. So nebulizer are, nebulizers are also available, but the inhalers are more portable. And I know some of you may have the nebulizers. And of course, in this point in time, COVID, um, trying to avoid the use of those. And I know I myself try to push the inhalers versus the nebulizer because of their um, more portability um, in that situation. So the quick reliever relaxes the muscles around the airways so that the air can get in and out. And so what that does is that helps treat the cough, wheeze, tight chest, and difficulty breathing. 
So this can be used, sorry, this can be used every four to six hours as needed whenever the symptoms are occurring. Um, like I mentioned before, it can also be used 15 minutes before exercise for those that get triggered with physical activity. And then also it can be used during an exacerbation, uh, 20 minutes every 20 minutes times three. So if they have symptoms, you can give it every 20 minutes uh, times three. So this is the student uh, asthma treatment form that we fill out. So as a provider, I fill this out and I sign it so that I can give it to my patients and I tell them that they need to present this to the student or the school nurse. And that way they can, um, you can utilize this to as a guide, what to treat, when to treat, um, all the information that you need to be able to help them treat their asthma. So um, keeping this on file for a quick reference is um, great to keep with their asthma medication. So recording um, student quick reliever use. This is really important, like I said, about the symptoms. Um, if they are having a trend of needing their quick reliever more and more often, we would want to make sure that you notify the parents. So keeping a diary form like this or a card that kind of documents and keeps track of each student and when they're using their medication. So if they're using their medication uh, more than twice a week, they should uh, receive a notice like this and you should send this to uh, the student family. And so basically that tells them that they have used their inhaler more frequently and that way they can uh, make changes at home. And like I'll talk about here in a minute, the asthma action plan, they would want to advance into um, a yellow zone in that situation. These are the different spacers that are available and ones that we use and hand out here at Children's Mercy. So the small mask, of course, are for our younger kiddos who are infants. Um, the medium mask is kind of our school age. Uh, and then the large mask is for those who are older but may need to still continue to use the mask uh, due to their ability to, uh, to rather than using the mouthpiece. And then of course the mouthpiece is for older kiddos that are five years and older. We kind of judge based on their ability to breathe in nice and slow and to hold their breath. So sometimes it might be a little older than five years. So this is information that we provide our asthma uh, kiddos. And basically we really encourage spacer use. So please make sure that every student has a spacer and that they use it with their quick reliever albuterol. Um, basically, as you can see here in the middle, if we use just the inhaler, it, it, the, the medication only gets to like the mouth, the throat, the stomach, and then finally a little bit in the lungs. But when we use the spacer, it's specifically designed to get the medication, all of it down into the lungs where it needs to go. So the spacers, uh, kind of as the last slide, there are the ones with the face mask and there's the ones with the mouthpiece. They have different techniques and how they're used. So being aware of that and helping your students uh, to use them properly is really important. So shaking the inhaler prior to putting it on the end of the spacer, um, putting it on there with the mask, you wanna make sure it's nice and sealed to their uh, face, so covering their nose and their mouth nice and tight. And then once you activate the inhaler, they'll wanna breathe at least five breaths, but if you can get 10 out of them, that would be best. So they just breathe normal in and out. There's a flap at the top of the spacer that you can see that will go back and forth that will tell you that they're breathing in and out. The one on the right here is the mouthpiece. And so basically that one you is the one where you do the same technique, shake the inhaler, put it on the end. And before they use it, they want, you wanna have them take a deep breath in and then let it out. And then you'll have them put the mouthpiece up to their mouth, activate the inhaler, and then they'll take a nice slow deep breath in and then hold it for 10 seconds. This particular spacer has a mechanism on it that if they're breathing in too fast, then it will whistle at you. 
And I know some people just in my practice, I have encountered several people who have thought that they were supposed to have it whistle. So making sure that they understand the proper use of the spacer is really important um, because that maximizes the amount of medication that gets down inside the lungs. So this is our asthma action plan. Um, from Children's Mercy, they vary depending on different organizations. So just kind of being aware of the basic uh, layout and kind of how you move, maneuver from one zone to another. Um, this must be provided to you as a school nurse so that you know what your patients are taking and what their triggers are is the biggest thing. So you know what triggers and so that way they come to you when they do have a trigger and need treatment. Um, this also comes into play, like I mentioned before, when they have symptoms more than twice a week, they're gonna go to their yellow zone. So I'll talk more about that here in just a minute and each zone and what they mean. Um, also, this plan helps kind of recognize and to be able to treat for early signs of flare-ups um, so that you can treat symptoms right away. It also informs uh, when you need to seek additional treatment like oral prednisone, or emergency care. So the green zone is when the student feels like they're doing well, they can breathe easy, they don't have symptoms such as cough, wheeze, difficulty breathing, they can play and sleep without having any symptoms, um, which is why it's green zone. So it's kind of like the, the stoplight, green means go, yellow means slow down, and red means stop. So um, for what to do in this zone, your child's, the child will continue their controller inhaler. Like I mentioned before, most of the time they will have a controller inhaler in this zone, and, uh, but there may be a chance where some of our kiddos that just have intermittent plans where they only have something in the yellow zone. So it's kind of a good idea to know what kids have inhalers they're doing at home and which ones they, that do not. So the yellow zone, kind of like I mentioned before, is slow down. So the child starts to have a flare up. They're starting to have symptoms, um, the coughing, wheezing, difficulty breathing, tight chest, any of those symptoms. And again, it's more than twice a week or more than twice a week they're using their albuterol inhaler. Or if they have uh, the first sign of a cold, as we know, colds affect you know the the lungs and breathing. Um, with asthma, it can make things get worse and worse, and so we want to increase their medication in this zone to help them get through that illness without any troubles. So what do they do? They need to use their rescue inhaler when they're having the symptoms, making sure that they're treating them two puffs every four hours for any symptoms like the cough, wheeze, trouble breathing, tight chest, any of those. Also, the child will add the, like I mentioned, we increase the medication during this zone. So whatever they were in the green zone, we either add an additional dose, increase their dose, or we add another controller medication. Um, again, we're adding medication to get the symptoms under control. And so once they uh, get their symptoms resolved, we usually say about two weeks in this zone. I usually tell my patients if two weeks goes by and they're still having some trouble with their symptoms or still having them to stay there until their symptoms are gone. That way they're more likely to easily go back to the green zone and not have to advance back to the yellow zone. The red zone, this obviously means danger, which is red. Um, so basically the symptoms are becoming worse and worse despite their treatment. So they may be in yellow zone using their increased medication and um, they're not getting relief. So they're using their albuterol more frequently, doesn't seem to be working. Their symptoms like the cough and wheeze are more constant. They have trouble breathing even when they're at rest. Breathing may be rapid or difficult. Um, you may even see suprasternal, substernal, or intercostal re retractions. Um, also, the symptoms are so frequent that they will have trouble walking, talking, sleeping, um, any of those due to their symptoms. So this is pretty severe. So this is when we really wanna gain control of their 
um, asthma symptoms, and this is where that oral steroid or the prednisone comes into play. So that's when typically um, the kiddos that are more higher at risk for going to this zone, I make sure that I do go ahead and send a prescription so that they can keep those at home um, in case they need to start it. They can call us and then that way they have it at home and can immediately start it once we give the okay. Um, the kids that have more experience and know when to start it, I usually tell them to just go ahead and start it on their own and then uh, call the clinic to ask for and decide on a follow-up date. So this, uh, in this zone, you also continue the rescue inhaler and treating the symptoms, two puffs every four hours for any symptoms. The parent will need to contact the asthma provider, like I mentioned, to make sure that um, they follow up and, and make sure that they're getting better versus worse. Um, the parent is also to call 911. On the asthma action plan, it talks about when to call 911. So when their symptoms are more severe and they have blue lips or fingernails, things like that, they'll want to call 911. So your role as a school nurse um, is really important. So several things that I kind of talked about along the way, uh, maintaining a current asthma action plan. So making sure that you have that on file for each student that has asthma um, and keeping the forms that you have for them, like the documentation form for the asthma medications um, all together. Also recognizing the potential asthma triggers, being aware of those and knowing when those things might occur, like weather, for instance, when um, there are weather changes, you may have an increase in the number of students that come to you for their quick reliever because they have weather as a trigger. Also being aware of the signs and symptoms of attack so you know when you need to treat the student's um, asthma symptoms. Also assisting the student with the proper administration of the inhaler, making sure that they're using it correctly, making sure that they're using the spacer and using the spacer correctly. Also knowing which students can self-carry. Obviously these are gonna be the much older kids who know how to use their medication properly and can also notify the staff when they are using it. Because um, although they can self-carry and self-use it, um, it would be really important to make sure that somebody knows that they've used it. That way, if their symptoms um, get worse, that somebody can, can intervene. Um, also identifying when emergency services or calling 911 is necessary. So if you have a, a student that has symptoms and you do not have any treatment for them, um, or signs of the poor oxygenation, which I talked about earlier, about blue lips or fingernails, you would wanna call 911 to help. So the student role is to make sure that they get their asthma action plan, a current one from their provider before school starts and to make sure that they give that to you um, as this, the school nurse. Also to provide, the, provide you with that plan, but they also need to provide you with the inhaler and spacer. So they need one separate for their school. So as a provider, I know here at Children's, um, all the providers will do two albuterol inhalers when we prescribe them for that specific reason. We want them to have one at home or one that they can carry with them, but also have one that they can present to you at school. Um, we would have them place them in a sealable plastic bag, uh, label them with student name, grade, and teacher. That is for easy identification, and that way you make sure that you get the, that specific student's medication. Um, and like I mentioned before, keeping their forms all together, documentation forms, and all of that. Also notifying school staff um, of asthma symptoms when they occur. So they need to be able to identify, and I talk with my patients several times, even at younger age, trying to talk to them and make sure that they understand what symptoms they have and what symptoms they need to go ask for their um, albuterol. 
Because, yeah, the, the teachers and other people might notice it, but it's really important as soon as they know that they're having symptoms to make sure that they get treatment. So that's all. <laughs> I think I went through that kind of fast. Um, but I kind of liked this uh, school nurse's office. My job is mostly seasonal. The busiest times are cold season, flu season, and allergy season. So that's pretty much, I feel like, sums up <laughs> your job. And also, um, I'm the school nurse. Of course, I have issues, wait, tissues. Um, so I thought those were kind of fun. Um, I will go ahead, I didn't include a slide um, about this, but I just wanted to kind of talk about the COVID and how our department in um, allergy asthma is dealing with the COVID and mask. We have had several parents um, reach out to us and ask us to write letters and such to basically have their student um, or child to not wear a mask because they fear that the asthma symptoms will worsen or that it's gonna increase their difficulty breathing. And I try to reassure parents and, and I am telling you this so that hopefully you can also reassure the students that they're going to be okay with the mask on. I've reassured them and made sure that they understand it's gonna take practice. So if they can practice now before they start school and can start with short periods of time, even just a couple minutes if they're really afraid to use the mask or have trouble breathing. Um, start with a few minutes and gradually extend it over time. That way they can get used to using the mask um, for when they go to school. So really encouraging and, and letting them know that it is safe. It's not going to increase their symptoms. It may make it harder to breathe when they do have symptoms, but treating those symptoms is the most important when that does happen. Um, so we do recommend keeping the mask on and for all of our asthma kids because obviously they're more at risk and we wanna make sure that um, we prevent them from getting the COVID. So that's really about it. That's all I have. Thank you for having me today. We're going, to take a, we're going to take a quick minute to um, wipe down our surfaces here real quick. <laughs> Darren, we'll have you bring up the next slide presentation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Tiffany Music. She is a pediatric endocrinologist. She is also the co-director of our Children's Diabetes Center here at Children's Mercy. And she is a assistant professor at UMKC uh, in pediatrics. And we'd like to thank her for joining us today and we'll let her go ahead with her presentation about an update on diabetes. Thank you. And go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more. Who oh, does it bright up here? Hi there, I am Dr. Tiffany Music. Uh, I am originally from Maryland and I did my residency at uh, Akron Children's Hospital and then did my fellowship here at Children's Mercy and I've been attending here for eight years. So this is just to give you an idea of what our Children's Mercy population looks like. We have 2,125 total patients with diabetes and approximately 300 patients with type two diabetes. Uh, for the epidemiology of uh, type 1, 1 1.45 cases per 1,000 in youth younger than 20 years of age. And then the prevalence by race is 2 per 1,000 in non-Hispanic children, 1.34 per 1,000 in African-American children, and 1 per 1,000 in Hispanic children. And this is just a chart that kind of shows you where the data came from for those statistics in case you wanted to know. So the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes is that there is beta cell death caused by autoimmune destruction. And it's thought to be that there is the autoimmune trigger and that 80% of the pancreatic cells have to die um, before signs and symptoms to present. 
uh, there is a genetic predisposition with uh, chromosome 6, the major histocompatibility complex, DR3, DQ2, DR4, DQ8. Um, are the, the main ones. We actually do not test for those, but it's just known from past research that there is a genetic predisposition. And this is a diagram showing the uh, slippery slope to developing diabetes. Um, so initially there is a genetic susceptibility and then there's thought to be an environmental trigger. Uh, there has been research to show that enterovirus or other viruses are likely the environmental trigger, given that we tend to see a peak in the fall as well as in the spring. And then uh, patients develop autoimmune antibodies, and then you get clinical onset, and then you have loss of C-peptide. So we can have patients that have type 1 at diagnosis and still have a detectable C-peptide because they haven't uh, finished um, having all of the cell destruction of the beta cells. So signs and symptoms of diabetes are polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, nocturia, or new onset bedwetting in a kid that had previously been potty trained a weight loss, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, and lethargy. So our diagnostic criteria for diabetes is if they have a fasting blood sugar that is uh, over 126 or greater, or a random blood sugar that's 200 or greater. And then uh, just so you're aware, glucose urea occurs when the blood sugar is 180 or greater. Uh, for A1C, we, we get those every three months for our patients, but I like to kind of correlate the A1C with what a blood sugar means. So if you take the A1C and you subtract two and multiply by 30, you can get the average blood sugar. So if the patient has a A1C of 11, that would equal an average blood sugar of 270. At onset, we get a bunch of different labs. We get the C-peptide, and then there's four diabetes antibodies that we get at onset, which are the four antibodies that are known at this point in time. They are insulin antibodies, islet cell uh, antigen 512 antibodies, GAD65 antibodies, zinc transporter antibodies, and A1C uh, TSH because about 20% of patients with type 1 will go ahead and eventually develop thyroid dysfunction, and they can develop hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, and about 5% of patients uh, will develop celiac disease. So these, this is a slide that shows the different therapies. Aspart, Lispro, or Glulysine are the names for Novolog, Humalog, and Epidra. There's also Fiasp, uh, and it works pretty similar. Uh, Regular is in blue, NPH is in purple, Detamir is the other name for Levamir, and then Lantus is the other name for Glargine, and then there is a newer medication on the market called Degludec, which is Traceba. And so what you can see with this slide is that uh, uh, the short-acting insulins, which are the Humalog, Novolog, Apidra, they peak at about 30, to, um, 30 minutes to an hour, and then they're gone by about four hours, versus regular peaks at about two hours and can last up to eight hours. And then Levomir um, is listed as a long-acting insulin, but it tends to only last about 12 hours, so we tend to dose it twice a day. Some patients can get away with having it dosed once a day, but it doesn't tend to work quite the full 24 hours. And then the red line is the Glargine or the Lantus, and you can see that it takes about two hours for it to kick in, and then it's pretty steady until about 24 hours. This is just a chart with all of that information all written out. And then there is Degludec on the uh, bottom, which is the Traceba, and it is different than the other long-acting insulins in that it reaches steady state after about three days. It does not have a peak, and its total duration is 40 hours. So it still has to be given every 24 hours, but the advantage of it is if a patient misses a nighttime dose of Traceba, then they can go ahead and take it the next morning and they can still take their nighttime dose that same day as long as there's eight hours in between doses. So we do try to get um, our non-compliant patients on Traceba uh, because it does provide them a little bit buffer of uh, protection. And some insurances cover it, some do not. Medicaid often requires um, 
failure of two long-acting insulins before they will approve it. And that's for both Kansas and Missouri. Uh, so in the honeymoon phase, which is right after they are diagnosed, about 10 to 20% of those beta cells are still working. So once you add the insulin, the, there's no longer the glucotoxicity, and those beta cells are still working. So for patients, it can be a couple of months that it lasts for, and some it lasts for a year. Um, and basically how you can tell if a patient's coming out of the honeymoon phase is that their blood sugars are just starting to creep up and they need more insulin. It's not that all of a sudden they wake up and their blood sugar is 400. It's just a gradual um, increase in their insulin needs. Hypoglycemia, so we define it as less than 80 in a child that is less than five, and that's because those patients often have difficulty uh, stating their symptoms. Uh, if they are five and older, the blood sugar is less than 70. In mild to moderate, we treat with 15 grams of short-acting carbohydrates, such as juice or glucose tabs, and then have them recheck in 15 minutes. And if that once they've given gotten the blood sugar above 70, then we ask that they uh, treat with a uh, snack that has some complex carbohydrates such as fat and protein because the, the short acting uh, simple sugars will raise the blood sugar up, but if you don't have any fat or protein with it, then it will shoot the blood sugar right back down. Um, and if they have a severe episode where they're unconscious or seizing, then we give glucagon and call 911 or have them go to the ER. Um, and if you give glucagon, then obviously you will see a, a high blood sugar following that and you don't treat that high blood sugar. So sick day management. So this is what a lot of um, a lot of things that we hear and a lot of calls that I'm guessing that you guys see as well. Uh, for hyperglycemia, we use what's called a correction factor. Um, and how we calculate that is we do 1800 divided by their total daily dose. And you only want to give that every two hours because again, that insulin, the short acting insulin lasts about two to three hours. So if you give it sooner than every two hours, then you can stack the insulin and cause low blood sugar. So uh, if they're sick, even if they aren't feeling great, they still need to take their insulin. So they still need to get their long acting insulin, even if they're not eating great, or if they're on their pump, they would still be attached to their pump and still getting their background basal rate. Um, if they're sick and they're not feeling great, then we'll often have them dose after their meals during that time, just to ensure that they've eaten all the food that they have been given. And then we tell them that they need to eat carbs every four hours, and that's to prevent the formation of starvation ketones. So we let them know you can do a half a cup of juice or a piece of bread or four to six ounces of decaf soda or a half of a twin popsicle um, to make up for those carbs if they're not feel like, like they wanna eat a whole bunch of food when they feel sick. And then if they're sick and they have uh, their blood sugar is greater than 240 or ill. So ill is what we think of as if they're feeling nauseated or if they're vomiting, then they really need to check for the ketones because stomach flu and DK can look exactly the same. The way you distinguish between the two is obviously, are we forming ketones or are we not? And so for moderate ketones, we give 10% of the total daily dose. And for large ketones, we give 20% of the total daily dose. And again, that dose we only want to give every two hours. Um, and then we have a, a ketone action plan. It was actually a project that I did as a fellow to develop um, a way for our, our patients to have a way of knowing how to give the dosing for their ketones. So um, we will go over that in a little bit. Um, this is uh, in your, your new school orders for this year, but we have a specific section for automated technology and ketones. So any of the pumps that are giving extra insulin in the background, those have to be turned off when we're treating ketones. And the reason is, is that those pumps don't know that we have given an injection, and so they will continue to kind of ramp up the insulin that's being given and could cause problems with low blood sugar. So we do have instructions in the school orders on how to turn it off. For Medtronic, it's called auto mode, and for the tandem T-Slim pump, it's called control IQ. So the reason why we always get worried about ketones is because of DKA. 
Um, and when we get DK, it's because our body's not getting enough insulin. And so as a result, the liver starts breaking down glucose um, and making it having glycogen gluconeogenesis, um, we also get glycogenolysis, uh, muscle starts breaking down protein to amino acids, which triggers ketone development, and then the fat tissue also starts to break down. Um, because even though there is glucose present in the bloodstream, it is not making its way into the cells, so the body perceives itself as starving. And so the number one treatment um, for DN DK8 is insulin. Um, it stops the production of ketones and allows for the body to utilize the glucose. And our typical drips are run at 0.1 units per kilo per hour. And then for fluids, we wanna do volume, they're volume depleted because they're dehydrated from all of the hyperglycemia that they're having and the acidosis that they're experiencing. So we give an initial fluid bolus and then we follow with fluid replacement at one and a half times maintenance. And so our definition of DKA is a pH less than 7.3, a bicarb less than 16, hyperglycemia, ketonemia, and ketonuria. And so uh, most evidence for DK management comes from non-randomized control studies. Um, and there are several consensus guidelines with the most recent one being from ISPAD, which is the International Society for Pediatric uh, Diabetes, came out in 2018. And so the basic managements are to correct the acidosis, rehydrate, decrease hyperglycemia, treat uh, any underlying conditions, and to avoid the complications related to DKA, which would be cerebral edema, hypokalemia, hypoglycemia. And so it is fairly common in our new onset patients because they, they don't know that they have diabetes. So about 15 to 67% of new onsets can actually present with DKA. Um, those younger than four, if no one in the family has type one diabetes or a lower socioeconomic status is associated with presenting with DKA at onset. Um, in kids that are known to have DKA, um, the risk for DKA is one to 10% per patient per year. And, and those at risk are those that have poor diabetes control, adolescent females, those that have underlying psychiatric disorders, difficulty, social situation, insulin pump therapy. So it's not the actual insulin pump itself, it's more that uh, the pump will not tell you if it is not delivering the insulin per se. So if the insulin pump site has come out and it's still kind of laying on the skin, it's still dribbling out insulin. It just doesn't know that it isn't sub Q into the body. So it will, it will not trigger an alarm or a warning in that. And then it usually will, the pump will say site occluded if there is a site occlusion, but you usually have to be pretty occluded for that alarm to go off uh, in the pump. So it's not the pump therapy itself. Um, and we actually at Children's Mercy do put a lot of our patients that are non-compliant on um, insulin pumps because then we know they're at least getting some background insulin since they only have to change that site every two to three days. Um, these were, all, we already went over these. Uh, so typically what we do is that those kids are going to get a fluid bolus initially for DKA. Um, typically their, their volume of the bolus is 10 mLs per kilo over one to two hours. And then um, we don't tend to do multiple fluid boluses because multiple fluid boluses are actually associated with cerebral edema. And then we put them on maintenance fluids. Typically we do about 1.5 times maintenance over the 24 hours. And then uh, we do potassium replacement. Uh, we typically start that right away unless they're hyperkalemic and then we have to wait for them to void before we, we give them uh, potassium. So, and we either use potassium fluoride, potassium phosphate or potassium acetate. It just kind of depends on the availability of them. I know a couple years ago we were having shortages in some of them. So we were mix and matching the types of potassium that we were giving patients. Um, there's no evidence that exists for the optimum timing of insulin therapy to begin. Typically, we start it right after they've got received their first fluid bolus. And this is just the reason why we use the 0.1 units per kilo per hour. Uh, we do not recommend giving bicarbonate. It actually um, can... Uh, 
increase risk for cerebral edema, so we do not recommend uh, bicarbonate therapy. Uh, the reason why we get concerned about cerebral edema or DKA is because of cerebral edema. So it causes the mortality of 0.15 to 0.3% of mortality from DKA, and that occurs in 57 to 87% of all deaths in DKA. It typically presents about four to 12 hours into therapy, but can present after when you just start therapy. And so they can have headache, changes in their levels of consciousness, have an inappropriate slowing of their heart rate and increase in blood pressure. Um, ways to prevent DKA, uh, it's comprehensive patient education and 24 hour access to the diabetes team. Uh, to reduce the risk of DK, which we have here at Children's Mercy. Um, they did not find any evidence of the positive impact of mental health in interventions. Um, and this is really key, uh, especially with your school nurses, is that insulin administration by a responsible adult decreases the risk of uh, DK episodes by tenfold. So obviously when they're at school and they're there for eight hours, it's really good because then there's a responsible adult that can help to manage them during those times. Uh, blood ketones versus urine ketones. So blood ketones are more reflective of the current state of ketosis. And then you're probably asking, well, why don't we give everybody blood ketones? It's because they're $5 a strip. And most of the time, uh, insurance doesn't cover it. So the urine ketones are, are, are cheaper. Um, and so that's why we use them. Um, and this just shows that the, the different uh, testing that they're, they're measuring is that the blood ketones are a little bit more specific. Uh, we do have our DK clinical practice guidelines if you ever want to look at them. If you go to the main Children's Mercy website and you can just type in clinical practice guidelines and then it'll say diabetic ketoacidosis and that will allow you to look at our protocol which we have been using since 2012. So a little bit about type 2 diabetes. So its epidemiology is a little bit different in that it's 22 cases per 1,000 youth. Um, this equals about 3,600 new cases per year. And based on the search study for diabetes, 42 per 100,000 youth between 10 to 19 years of age, one per 100,000 youth for ages zero to nine years of age, um, with the mean age of diagnosis being between 12 and 16 years of age, and females have a higher prevalence than males. Um, this just goes over. Uh, you can notice that the, the racial uh, mix of that is a little bit different than with the type one. Um, American Indians have 74 per 100,000. African Americans have 105 per 100,000. And then non-Hispanic whites have 19 per 100,000. Um, and of note, it's important to know if that a mom has gestational diabetes during pregnancy, her child um, has a 50% risk of developing type two during their lifetime. Whether it's they had, mom had gestational diabetes or mom had type two diabetes during pregnancy. Uh, it is multifactorial. We know that 74 to 100% of patients have a first degree relative with type two diabetes as compared to type one when only about 5% of type one patients have a relative with type one. Um, there is a gene mutation that's associated with uh, type two. And it is a little bit different than type one. So type one is immune mediated versus type two is not. So we get insulin resistance um, where the body doesn't respond well to the insulin and in turn the body makes more insulin. However, the uh, insulin regulate, uh, receptors actually downregulate. So there's more insulin being made, but there's less insulin receptors and it just kind of fuels and circles around on itself. Uh, there's also increase in inflammatory markers, which leads to decreased insulin production. And then um, they've noticed elevated uh, plasma free fatty acids. And so lifestyle does play a big role um, in the development of type two. Obviously pediatric obesity is a major contributor. About a third of kids in the US are either in the overweight or obese categories. Um, and it only takes about 100 extra calories a day to gain a pound per month. So if they drink one glass of sugar containing drinks a day, that will lead to about 16 pound weight gain per year. And so that's regular soda, Gatorade, G2, sweet tea, Kool-Aid, any of the flavored milks, chocolate milk, strawberry milk, anything like that. Um, 
adds in those extra calories. Even if the flavored milk is low fat, um, it still has about 200 calories per glass because they're getting that um, extra calories from the sugar for the flavoring. Reasons to screen, so, so patients will get screened if they're overweight or obese, or if they have two of the following risk factors, so a family history of type 2 diabetes, depending on what their race is, if they have acanthosis nigricans, which is darkening of the skin um, in the flexural areas, so uh, on the knuckles, on the back of the neck, on the elbows, on the knees, um, in the groin area. Uh, hypertension, if a child was small for gestational age, if there's cardiovascular disease in the family, um, if there's uh, signs of extra hair where there shouldn't be um, in females, if they have uh, fatty liver disease, or if they have PCOS. This slide just looks at the difference between the two. So if you'd like to reference that. Um, as far as uh, Looking at the treatment for type 2, there was a big study called the Today Trial a couple years ago, and it looked at kids between 10 to 17 years of age with type 2 that had had type 2 for less than two years. Uh, their BMI was 85% or greater. They had a detectable C-peptide, um, and the patients that were excluded had renal insufficiency, uncontrolled hypertension, liver disease, or uncontrolled hyperlipidemia. And so they had three treatment arms in that study. So they had metformin monotherapy, metformin with intensive lifestyle modifications, and metformin and rosiglitazone. Um, and we don't use rosiglitazone anymore um, following this study because it was shown to have cardiac effects. Um, but what they did look for this in the study is that the length of time to glycemic failure, which they defined as an A1C of 8% or greater, for at least six months or the inability to get off insulin. And what they noticed was about 45% reached glycemic failure in a little under the four years. And they noticed that um, the metformin and the rosiglitazone was most effective in girls where there was only a 35% failure rate, but they didn't notice any difference among the boys. And then as far as racial differences, they noticed that non-Hispanic blacks had the highest failure rate at 52.8%, and that was with metformin monotherapy alone. Um, and then um, the failure rate for Hispanics was 45%, and non-Hispanics whites was 36.6%. We do know that an A1C greater than 6.3% or more at the time of initiation of metformin therapy was shown to be a predictor of eventual glycemic loss. Um, so every 0.1% increase on that A1C, there was a 16% increase in loss of glycemic control with a medium time of loss of control of 11 months. And so they were using that criteria of a hemoglobin A1C of eight. Uh, complications are, are more common in type 2, and they can even be diagnosed at the onset. Um, so for hypertension, 11.6% of the kids had hypertension, and by the end of the study, uh, a third of the patients had hypertension. Uh, microalbuminuria or protein in the urine, 6.3% had it at baseline, and then 16.6% had it by the end of the study. And then retinopathy, they only looked at that at the end of the study period, but 13.7% had retinopathy. And then uh, lipids was 4.5%, and then it had doubled to 10.7% by the end of the study. And so um, we don't have a whole lot of medications approved for type 2 in kids. So we have the metformin, and yes, there recently was a recall. Uh, so most patients are getting switched to the regular strength metformin instead of the extended release. There's now been seven companies that have um, been recalled because of contamination with M NMDA. Uh, or we have insulin, and then the newest medication is a GLP-1, which is Victoza, or its generic name is Liragulotide, which has been approved for kids 10 and up, and it's a GLP-1. So it's a glucagon-like peptide 1 that decreases uh, blood glucose by enhancing secretion of insulin. And so when they gave these patients the Liragulotide, um, they noticed that the A1C dropped by 0.64%. 
um, versus 0.42% of placebo. Um, and the only reason why patients didn't tolerate it is they had some GI side effects, nausea and, di and diarrhea. So now we're gonna move on to kind of the different types of therapy that we have. So um, for continuous glucose monitoring, we have about 20% of our patients on that, but recently both Missouri Medicaid and Kansas Medicaid have started to approve continuous glucose monitors. So we're really trying to get um, all the patients that, that um, want the therapy um, to get on the therapy. And so how the sensor works, so there's three parts to it. There's the sensor, which is the thin filament that lives under the skin, right here. The transmitter, which is the piece that you see, and then the receiver, which could be a phone, or it could be an insulin pump, um, or it could just be a standalone device that you see for the, the data, um, or the, th the three parts of it. And it continuously measures the glucose and the fluids every five minutes. And depending on the brand, it lasts between seven to 14 days. And so this is a graph to just show you the difference between finger sticks versus CGM data. So the, the red dots are the finger sticks and you can see um, we have red dots and they're, they're within the target zone but the data that we don't get as we see here with the continuous glucose monitor is that there were lows here that would not have been, would have been missed with, without the CGM data. And then also these missed highs that were occurring here. And so a finger step number can't tell you which direction the blood glucose is going. Uh, but the CGM can tell you which way it's going. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it rapidly rising? Is it rapidly falling? Or is it steady state? So um, here it shows two arrows down, meaning that that blood sugar is rapidly falling. The more arrows that are, are go on the screen means the more rapid of a change you are seeing. And so we have a number of different uh, options. So. There is the Dexcom G6, it is standalone. So it can um, go to the phone, it can go to an Apple Watch, or it can go to its own little receiver. Um, it is nice in that there are no finger sticks required. So it does not require any calibration. It is just as good as finger sticks. Patients put it on, they leave it for 10 days and it will alarm for highs and lows. And then, like I said, it, it gets sent to, uh, there's different options for the family to choose for the, the transmission, um, and then some of the insulin pumps, it, the, the CGM will actually transmit directly to it. So that will display on the pump, and I have that in a couple of kits uh, in a little bit. And then it is approved for kids two and up, but obviously if we have younger kids, we do try to get them on a sensor. Uh, the next option is the Freestyle Libre. It is standalone. I'm sure you've probably uh, seen the commercials. They say like Libre ready. Um, and they swipe the sensor um, with either their phone or the reader device. Uh, the current Libre that is out um, will only show you the blood sugar data if you swipe it. Uh, it doesn't require any finger sticks and it lasts for 14 days, but it does not have any alarms for highs or lows. And that is the Libre 1.0, which is approved for 18 and up. However, the Libre 2.0 was recently approved by the FDA for four and up, and it will actually have alarms for highs and lows and will display the graph um, on the, where they're getting the data. So either on their phone or the Libre reader, so that um, has yet to come to market yet, um, but that will, will be a good option for families. Uh, the Libre does not currently integrate with any of the pumps. Uh, and then the next option would be the Medtronic Guardian Connect. So this is a standalone CGM. Um, it is different than the Medtronic sensor that works with the Medtronic pump. Um, this one is different than the Libre and the Dexcom in that it does require finger stick calibrations and that has to be done at least twice a day. And it is a seven day wear. Um, and that data must go to an Apple device. I really don't think we probably have any patients on this this device, um, but it is available. Um, it does have alarms for highs and lows. We do have patients on the Medtronic sensor that works with the pump, but this, the Guardian, which is the standalone option, we really don't have any patients on. And so now we're gonna talk about some insulin pumps. 
So this is what the first insulin pump looked like. As you could see, it's very bulky. Um, and so we have come quite a bit since then. Um, so when patients are on pumps, they no longer need that long-acting insulin. So they're not going to be using the Lantus, the Traceba, the Levomir, or, or the Basiglar. They are going to be using short-acting insulin um, in their pump. And they typically wear it all the time, um, unless they're showering or bathing, or they're swimming, or they're doing contact sports. And so how the insulin pump works is that you have a basal rate, and that gives you a constant flow of background insulin that replaces that long-acting insulin. Um, and the nice thing about the pumps is you can adjust the basal rate based on the times of day. So when you give uh, the long-acting insulin, you've given that, and that's good for 24 hours, and you can't change um, that dose for 24 hours. Um, but if you're on the pump, you can make changes based on if they're running higher overnight, then you can give extra insulin at that time. And then uh, with the pumps, you give a bolus, and that's to give the dose for meal snacks or glucose corrections. So even with uh, the newer technology in the pumps, uh, families still have to bolus, so they still have to enter the carbs in um, along with the blood sugar to make sure that they get that mealtime insulin. And that is shown here. Um, if they are on um, multiple daily injections, they get their long-acting insulin, and then they get these boluses of short-acting insulin for their meals. And then if they're on the pump, the difference is, is that they have a basal rate. So you can see this basal rate is varying for this patient, but then they're still getting the boluses at their meals. And so with the tubed insulin pumps, which are the Medtronic and the T-Slim, um, you fill the pump's reservoir with enough insulin to last two to three days. Uh, the T-Slim pump requires 110 units for that pump to function, and the Medtronic has no um, minimum. And so basically what happens is you have the pump, and then you have the tubing, and then you have the uh, site that is right here, which is also known as an infusion set. And so there are, are different uh, infusion set options. So there is a plastic infusion set, or there's the option with the steel cannula, which it's, it's a pretty small um, steel needle that goes in. Um, what you'll notice with the steel cannulas is that there's two stickers. So this is the, the site that actually has the metal in it, and this is the secondary site. So this is just a sticker. And the reason why this one is here is if this tubing gets pulled, then this site could come off, but then this site would stay attached to the body. So we're gonna talk first about the Medtronic pump, and those are the 630G or the 670G. And so the 630G, you can use the uh, sensor with it. Um, they still need to you get uh, two finger sticks a day um, it will suspend insulin if it's predicting that there's a low blood sugar, and then it will restart once the blood sugar is uh, rising. You can dose from the meter. It is waterproof, although I do not recommend swimming with it. It uses a AA battery. There's no minimum fill, and it can hold up to 300 units. Uh, the 670G, if it's uh, integrated with the CGM, it looks a little bit different. So pump only, you're just going to, it's gonna ask you what the blood sugar is. If you have the pump and the CGM, then it's gonna show the CGM with the tracing there. If you have what's called auto mode, then you'll get a shield with what the current blood sugar is. And so the Medtronic system and, and now the Control IQ, they're considered hybrid closed loose loop systems. So the basal rate kind of adjusts in the background based on what is happening with the blood sugar and the pump automatically adjusts that basal rate. So there is a preset in the pump um, that we put for the basal rate. For example, if they get kicked out of what's called auto mode in the, the, the Medtronic pump, there is a, a background in that, but the, the patient still has to give those boluses for those food. And this is just an example of what the download looks like for the Medtronic pump. So, um, and this is just taken off the internet. It's not a personal patient or anything like that. Um, but this black line just shows what the average blood sugar is. The blue is what they're currently um, 
experiencing, and then the orange was the week before. So you're just seeing that this patient is doing great. They're in auto mode 99% of the time. Um, and then this kind of shows what's happening with the pump. So they are entering carbs in these, these options, but you can see this basal rate is constantly going up and down here, giving carbs, basal rates adjusting. So that's how it looks like um, on our downloads. So the next system that we have is the Tandem T-Slim pump, and it has a touchscreen display and it can be integrated with the Dexcom. So it will actually, the Dexcom will display on the pump instead of on the phone or on the receiver. Um, there is now a new app, so families can have the app on the phone. The app does not allow you to dose anything from it, but it does allow you to see what the pump is showing. Um, and they, um, are able to plug it in and upgrade it to the latest pump software, which is different from the other pumps. The other pumps, you do not have the ability to upgrade the software once they get it, and so each pump is warrantied for four years. So um, the nice thing about the T-Slim pump is that that software can get upgraded in, the, in that time if new software comes out. Um, it has a minimum fill of 110 units and can hold up to 300 units. And so the, the latest system is the Control IQ. It works with the Dexcom. There is no calibrations needed. Um, it adjusts the basal every five minutes. And the thing that's a little bit different with the T-Slim versus the Medtronic is it will actually give a correction bolus as needed. So not only will it adjust the basal rate, but if it senses that the, the patient needs a bolus, it will actually give a bolus. Um, but you still have to dose for the carbohydrates that are being given. Um, and they um, have it now, so you must be six years old and have a total daily dose of 10 units or weigh, great, or weigh greater than 55 pounds. And it, the FDA approval just changed. It was 14, now it goes down to six. And so there's different kind of settings on the control IQ. It does have a sleep or exercise mode, so this is not what it would do, um, but it will deliver a bolus if it, it detects that the blood sugar is gonna be greater than 180. It will increase the basal if it detects that the blood sugar is gonna be 160 or greater. If it's, everything looks good, it'll maintain it. If it looks like the blood sugar is gonna be less than 112, it decreases the basal rate. And then if it's less than 70, it will stop um, giving the basal. It does have um, two different um, features as well. It has a sleep activity and that sets the blood sugar of to 110 to 120. And then it has an exercise activity which sets a narrow and higher range. So instead of a blood sugar a target of being about 110 to 120, it raises that goal to 150. And so this is just an example of what the um, control IQ looks like. So you can see the basal here and then it gave some boluses here. We can see the blood sugar is going up here, so it decided to give some, some boluses here to account for it. This number up here indicates that the patient ate some carbs there, so that's why you're seeing these numbers here. And then the, the final pump that we have is called the Omnipod and the Omnipod Dash. It is different in that it has no tubing. Um, and you must use this personal uh, diabetes manager to give a bolus. So if they lose their PDM device, you cannot do anything with the pump. Um, the ne needle is never seen um, with insertion. The pod is waterproof. The PDM is not. Um, and it only holds up to 200 units. And you must fill it up with 85 units for it to work. Um, the dash is just a, an upgraded version of their PDM. Um, and it has a touch screen display um, and there you can get, view it on the phones. But again, the phone is not actually dosing anything. So you still need the actual device to do it. And so it is tubeless. So you can see it no longer has any tubing coming out of it. This is the little insulin pump right here. And that gets changed every two to three days. There are several apps um, for the pumps. So each pump company has an app that simulates each of their pumps. So there's an Omnipod app, there's a T-Simulator, which is for T-Slim, and then there's a Medtronic app, and it has a 670G or a 630G app as well. They're all integrated into one. So it's just the Medtronic Minimed app. 
Um, and so on the school orders, I just copied this so you guys could see, but this is the specific instructions for hybrid closed loop. And so it tells you how to kind of deal with all of these. And then this is how to disable those closed loop systems if they have ketones. Um, this shows you how to um, make some changes if they're having hypoglycemia with exercise. So in Medtronic, you have the ability to set a temp target for exercise, which usually sets it at 150, and then you just set the duration for it with, versus the T-Slim. You go into the pump and select the exercise mode, and that will do the same thing. And then I did come up with some case scenarios just for you guys to have. Um, so the first scenario is a nine-year-old male with hyperglycemia, and he is on shots. And so I just copied this from the school orders just so you could see there's a whole section about it. And this kid has a insulin sensitivity factor, a correction factor of 75. So that's filled out here in that box. Um, that box should have been marked off, so there should be an X there. But it has the sensitivity factor listed there. So this kid has a blood sugar of 300 and his sensitivity factor is 75 and his ketones were checked and they're negative. So you would do a calculation, so blood glucose minus target divided by the insulin sensitivity factor. Um, and so since this kid has had diabetes for a while, his, we would use a target of 120. For the new onsets, we use a target of 150, and that's reflected in the chart, and that'll be on the next example. So um, we use the rules for rounding, and so this kid would get a two unit correction since his dose calculates out to be 2.4. So scenario 1B is a kid that is newly diagnosed. So the school orders say to use the chart. And this kid would receive two units. And this kid's getting less because he has the, is in the honeymoon phase. And so I highlighted it here. You can see there's the, the 300 and that he would give two units for that. Uh, scenario 1C, so this patient is on the pump. So you would just go ahead and enter that blood glucose in the pump and it would determine the correction. And then this is what our section looks like in the school orders for ketone management. And we specifically give you those um, total daily doses. So you guys don't have to calculate what the moderate or large ketones doses are. Those are specifically typed in the school orders. So we have a 12 year old female with a blood glucose of 300 and she has moderate ketones and she has not eaten recently or had any corrections. So we would look at her school orders and we see that moderate ketones is six units and large ketones is 12 units. So since she's on a pump, or sorry, on injections, she would get six units via injection only. And that is the only dose that you would give. So when you're giving ketone doses, that supersedes the dose that you would calculate um, for corrections. And then you recheck the blood glucose and ketones in two hours. And now the second scenario is this patient's on control IQ, so she's got a tandem pump and has a blood sugar of 300 and moderate ketones. So here's where the orders say what to do for those kids that are in the, the auto mode or the tandem X2 control IQ. So um, you would disable the, the hybrid closed loop system. So you'd go into the control IQ, select options, my pump, Control IQ, toggle off, and check mark to confirm. And so anytime you have key, moderate or large ketones on a child with an insulin pump, they need to change out that pump site. Um, we would turn off the control IQ, would turn it back on once the ketones resolve, and then you'd recheck, uh, give this six units via injection, and then recheck the blood sugar and ketones in two hours, and then encourage fluids to help clear the ketones. So scenario 2C is that the patient has recently eaten and dosed and has a blood sugar of 300 and moderate ketones. So if they've recently eaten and dosed, you don't know how much of that insulin they actually received. So you don't wanna give an additional insul insulin dose because they may have um, received some of that. So in those scenarios, we recommend checking the blood sugar and ketones two hours after that last insulin dose, um, encouraging sugar-free fluids. And if the patient is on a pump, would recommend changing that pump site at that time. Um, scenario three is a five-year-old male with a blood glucose of 60 and they are able to talk. Um, and this is what the school orders talks about um, for hypoglycemia. So this kid is alert and awake. So you can go ahead and give him 15 grams of quick acting carbohydrates, which would be the half a cup of juice or the four glucose tabs or 15 Skittles. Um, and you wouldn't dose for those. And then you'd recheck in 15 minutes. 
Um, if the child's next meal or snack is more than 30 minutes away, you'd wanna follow it with a complex carb. So such as like peanut butter and crackers or a glass of milk um, without dosing. And then the student would be able to return to class as long as the blood sugar was normal and their symptoms have lessened. Um, if the child is not able to swallow, but they're still coherent, you can always put cake gel in the inside of the cheek. Um, if they are unconscious or seizing, um, due to low blood sugar, then you would administer glucagon. Um, there are now three different options for glucagon now. So there's the traditional glucagon, which comes as the powder, and then it has the uh, liquid on the top that you have to draw up the liquid and then mix it up and then give it. Um, there is an intranasal version called Baximi, um, and that canister already comes preloaded. So all you do with that is stick the tip in the nose and then push the button. There is no priming for the Baximi. If you push that button, it just sprays all the glucagon out. So the, the um, and I can attach those handouts. Um, I can give them to you guys to show what the difference between all of those, because I realized I did not include that in my um, section. And then there's another new version called Gvoke. So it comes as two options. So the one is a pre-filled syringe in that the glucagon is already mixed up. All it is, is it's already loaded and ready to go. You just give it as an injection. Um, or it also comes in an EpiPen type device, um, and it's given similar to a, an EpiPen shot there. So there's a couple new formulations that are, are out there um, now for that, so you might start seeing some of those. Um, and like I said, I can go ahead and give it to the, the program coordinator, and then we can give you that information um, too, so that way you can have the different ways to it, administer that. Um, and we're trying to switch a lot of them. A lot of parents are, are interested in the GVOC just because there is no mixing and they can pick either the syringe that's already mixed up or the EpiPen type device. And then finally, diabetes and COVID. So patients with diabetes are not considered at higher risk to catch COVID-19, but they are um, at higher risk to develop complications of contracting COVID-19. Now, um, the limited data that we have in pediatric patients, since most pediatric patients are tolerating COVID um, better than our adult counterparts, is that those kids are at increased risk for uh, DKA. So good glycemic control is our, our best combat um, for that. Uh, what we do know is that uh, when we're looking at the diabetes population and when, with all the COVID statistics is a lot of those adults have type two and they tend to have a lot of other uh, comorbid conditions for it. So they tend to be overweight or obese and have high blood pressure and have heart disease and all those kind of things. So it's multifactorial in those senses that they have more than one thing that elevates their risk risk factor um, for the kids. We have been mailing A1C kits to the patient's home. That is unique here to Children's Mercy, and we're actually gonna start offering that to outside institutions to be able to use those mail-in kits. Um, and that has actually put us uh, ahead of a lot of other diabetes centers uh, because they do not have those capabilities. And so a lot of the research studies um, tend to focus on what the A1C kit, or what the A1C is. And so without those kits, a lot of that research has come to us all but it hasn't here at Children's Mercy. Um, and we also have been offering telehealth visits for our patients with diabetes. Uh, we've been working hard on trying to get our families to connected um, with being able to download from home and using all of their technology appropriately. Um, we are working to change how we're doing things in clinic so we can have a mobile downloading station so we can wheel that into the family room and then teach them live how to download all of that equipment um, so that way they can see their data a little bit more clearly. Um, and so all of this has provided some unique experiences for us and we've definitely uh, changed. Um, our center recently got a big grant um, that Dr. Clements got um, that is allowing us to have uh, six QI groups and we're really focusing on different areas. So we have an inpatient group, a community group which focuses with school nurses and outside pediatricians. Um, we have a clinic group, uh, we have a transition group, and I'm gonna draw a blank on the other two at the moment, but needless to say, we have multiple uh, groups and we're really working on um, improving our diabetes care and kind of changing what we're doing. And, and uh, this experience with COVID-19 has allowed us to kind of rethink how we were doing some of our processes. So. That is all I have, um, and these are my references. And I made it on time, yay. Thank you for each of you. Um, Tiffany and Misty, there's uh, portable mics right behind you. So maybe if each of you wanna stand on either side of the screen. Um, everyone... So 
we'll have uh, Dr. Music and Misty um, gathered there on each side of the screen. And if you have questions, please type those questions into the chat box area. And Athenis will read off our questions to our speakers and then you guys can answer those and make sure your mics are on. And okay, yes, okay. Okay, there we go. All right, first question is, <clears throat> I believe this one is for Misty. Can we give it Q20 times three, even if it's not written on the prescription label? Can the docs start writing? Um, as far as the prescription, it's hard to include all of the details. So we typically write those details um, on the asthma action plans and as well as the form that goes to the school. Um, so that's an option. Um, just because there's multiple, we have to make sure that they, it says on the prescription, use with the spacer and things like that. So those are kind of the more important pieces. Thank you. Do you need a doctor order in order to use a spacer? No. Not all students have spacers. Is there a way to get them for free or cheaper? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the resources for getting them. Um, I think the biggest thing is, especially here at Children's, we do provide them at their visits. And then we also, to get a second one, we send it to their pharmacy. Can the parents access their child's asthma action plan on the parent portal? Yes, if they have the patient portal, they can access it. Now we do have to take a step in addition because of the format that is in the chart. We actually have to scan the color copy and send it to them that way. How feasible is an open line of communication with providers, faxing student progress notes directly to provider? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. How feasible is an open line of communication with providers, such as faxing student progress notes directly to the provider? You know, I honestly haven't had that communication, um, I think it's important um, to make that communication with the family. Um, but I think if they feel like they need to send it to the provider, they certainly can. Are you asking if, uh, I don't know if this question was directed to me or not, um, but I can say that all of the PCPs do get access to our clinic notes. So as long as the family has listed who their PCP is, those notes get to them. So it used to be that they were faxed, but now there's actually a portal for the physicians or the APRNs to log into. So that information is communicated directly back to the uh, PCP. Um, and then all of our groups here at Children's Mercy have some somebody on call uh, that is available 24 seven to answer calls from outside physicians. If they have questions, each group is a little bit different. Um, in endocrine, we have an inpatient doctor that answers all the inpatient questions and we have an outpatient doctor on call that answers outside PCP questions. Um, I don't know what they do with allergy, but uh, each section has their own way and, and our, the PCPs are able to reach out to any of the groups here at Children's Mercy. And this is more of a comment, a slide on the importance of wearing a mask, even if the student has asthma, uh, would be beneficial or very, yeah, be very beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> I have asthma and I've been intubated for my asthma. And as you can see, I rock the mask all the time. So <laughs> no, it's not related to diabetes, but. <laughs> What are guidelines if pulse oximeter is used? Um, we typically want the kind of the typical uh, pulse oximeter requirements of 92 or above. Okay. What about use of a face shield for chicken, I mean, not chicken, <laughs> children with asthma during the pandemic? I know there is some that say that you can use that. Um, it's an option, but there's still potential uh, based on the way it's designed. So I, I would suggest the mask over the face shield. Okay. 
The most recent recommendations from CDC are that face shields should not replace the use of a mask uh, because it obviously is not directly against the, the face. Um, so it can be used in addition to a mask. So in clinics, we have to wear face shields or, or, or goggles um, in clinic, but we can't just wear goggles or we can't just wear a face shield. So just to be um, aware of that. I did want to add that uh, I agree with you with you both, and that information can also be found on the school guidance that Children's Mercy uh, was able to develop and is on our website. Why change the site when ketones are present? So like I was talking about earlier is that if that site comes out and that plastic catheter is sitting on top of the skin and not actually in the sub-Q tissue, then the pump will not recognize that it is not actually delivering the insulin into the body. Um, so it will still be dribbling out. It will just be dribbling out on top of the skin and not inside the skin. And so anytime you develop moderate or large ketones, that shows that your body is not giving enough insulin. Um, and like I said, those pumps aren't going to alarm to say that there's a problem with that site. So the number one thing that we do is change out the pump site and then give a shot so that way we can stop those ketone production right then and there. Is there a way to contact uh, the diabetes clinic directly during schools for questions? having new onset diabetic this year along with previous diabetics? Uh, yeah, there is an option when you call our clinic phone number, which is 816-960-8803. Um, and there is an option to reach out to the diabetes team uh, with COVID. I believe now you have to leave a voicemail, but someone is checking those voicemails frequently and we'll get back with you. We used to do live calls when we had more people in person, but obviously COVID has changed those things, but there is always a way to reach out to the team to get the answers that you need. And there's a statement that you can get a spacer over the counter at a drugstore or online, usually for about $15. Asthma and Allergy Foundation provides free spacers to their districts as well. So that's a good resource. Uh, for asthma, CDC has okay to do peak flows at school, but the AAAAI has stated that it is dangerous, dangerous and could cause aerosolized COVID. Please advise. Yeah, that's correct. So we actually are not currently performing breathing tests. So that would include the peak flow as well as our breathing test because the aerosolized. So. I would recommend not doing that unless they have the proper PPE to perform that. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about puberty and any effects it may have on blood glucose control? Yes, so uh, the joys of puberty. <laughs> uh, it does cause hyperglycemia for most kids. Um, and then when girls have their period, most girls will have hyperglycemia with their period. Now, typically if they're on shots, we're not gonna adjust their Lantus dosing because like I said, that Lantus or Traceba or Levamir is, is sticking around for quite some time. And if their period all of a sudden stops quickly, you still have that insulin on board. So we warn our patients that they will likely have to give more corrections if they're on their period and they're on shots. Um, if they're on the pump, then there's the option to do a temporary basal where you can actually increase that basal rate and you can set that for a specific time from anywhere from zero to 24 hours. So that makes it nice that if all of a sudden the period decreases in flow and they're not having as many high blood sugars, then they can just go back in and, and cancel that out. But that, that temporary basal only lasts for up to 24 hours. So they do have to reset that each time. Um, the other option is, is some patients will put in a second basal and they'll call it whatever they like, period, red, Fred, I don't know, it just is all up to the different patients um, that they'll just switch to that basal rate when they're on. Um, their period is another option is to put in extra settings in the pump specifically for that and then just switch it over to the other basal rate when their period is done. Sometimes we do not get an asthma action plan from students. Do you have a generic asthma action plan to use? Um, as far as an asthma action plan, we don't, but the form that we use to send to schools is generic. It's pretty much identical for every student. 
The mass slide was more to assist with in educating parents and helping ease their minds. I agree all students should wear the mask. Maybe if you all are familiar, do we have any, it might be in the kids' health, but I was wondering of other information for parents on easing their minds for sh children with asthma to wear a mask. Yeah, there's a couple of websites. So um, the Quad AI or the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy and Immunology, they have a lot of really good resources on their website that provide information on the benefits and kind of easing their mind and that kind of thing. They have like a PDF um, as well as some other like research-based information. Okay. And it looks like I skipped over a question on insulin factor. Mm -hmm. Let me try to see if I can find it on here. Is uh, looking for that question I related to. You guys have a couple of web, uh, links that you could, if you could send those to us. We have several that we're going to be adding to the school nurse site. And if you could give us those in that PDF. Okay. Helen Murphy has provided us some things that we'll put in that area, but if you wouldn't mind just mailing the email that afterwards, we'll make sure that it's in that resource area for everyone. Okay, so I found it. It was just something very simple. I apologize. Please define what an insulin sensitive factor is. So an insulin sensitivity factor, or it can also be called correction factor, is how much one unit will drop the blood sugar. So it depends on how much insulin that patient is on. So that's why I put the slide in at the very beginning. Um, how we calculate it is it's called the 1800 rule. So 1800 divided by the total daily dose tells us what that correction factor or insulin sensitivity factor should be. Um, and that's a guideline. So um, when they're diagnosed and we're using those tables, the number varies. So for the new onsets, it's um, less than five. Those kids get an insulin sensitivity factor of um, 150. For kids five to 10, we use 75. And then 10 and up is um, 50. So we just use some uh, basic ones uh, for that. And we really haven't seen any hypoglycemia with using those rules um, in our new onsets. And then once they've had diabetes for a while, then we do use that calculation. Um, it is just a calculation. So if a patient calculates down to 80 and they're using 100 and that 100 is working, then we don't change that number. Um, if I see a kid like that and they're at 100 and it calculates out to 80, usually I'll just split the difference and say, okay, let's try 90. If 90 doesn't work, then we can go to 80. So there is some art uh, to that, but it does give us some guidelines on what they should be using. And that's why we provide that in the school orders along with the ketone doses so that um, you know exactly what the insulin sensitivity factor is and you know exactly what those ketone doses are. Um, and what we tend to do is give them new school orders at each of their diabetes appointments um, for that. And those, the school orders are available on the patient portal. Uh, for the families to access as well. Um, but I know when I see my own patients, I just print them off and hand them a copy at each visit. So that way uh, I don't have to worry about even if they have portal access, that they have access to a printer. Perfect. It looks like we don't have any other questions uh, listed on here. Thank you both very, very, very much. Um, I hope that all of you got the information that you needed. If you do have a question later, you can put it in the chat box and we will forward it to them. And if you guys don't mind, you could email them. Um, just make sure we have your email address with your question. We do have a break now until um, 10.30. We're a little ahead of schedule, so you get a little longer break. We'll be setting up for our panel that will start at 1030 and we will proceed then. So please keep your link on and be prepared to join us again at 1030. Thank you.
Welcome back to the School Health Conference. We are going to move into our COVID section of our program today. And we will, like I mentioned before, we will have three panelists. We are going to start out with Dr. Angela Myers. Angie is going to discuss kind of the clinical aspects and what's new with all the information coming and going related to COVID-19 as we get ready to bring the school year back up into session here in a month or so. We'll be followed by Dr. Simone Moody, who will talk about anxiety and co-helping patients and, excuse me, kids and families cope with the anxiety and the fears and, and some of their um, just questions that they might have of handling how kids will handle the situation there in the classrooms. And we'll end our panel with Shelby Rebeck, who's the Health Services Director for Shawnee Mission School District. So we'll start out with Angie. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to come speak with you all today. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I wanted to start just quickly to orient ourselves to what's going on in our country. This is a map from the CDC I pulled earlier this week, looking at what the reported cases look like uh, between every state. You can see Kansas is um, in the blue between 20,000 and 40,000, and Missouri is in the darker blue, 40,000 or more. And the statistics I have at the bottom of this slide I pulled yesterday from the Department of Health um, from both the state of Kansas and Missouri. You can see that Kansas had over 26,000 in cases with 1,700 hospitalizations, almost 350 deaths, with a case positivity rate right now of 9.4%. Missouri's had more than 46,000 cases with almost 800 uh, hospitalizations and over 1,200 deaths with a, case, with a seven day positivity rate of 9.6%, so very similar. So what we know, um, about the burden of COVID in children from the US, but also from around the world, as data has been gathered from um, different countries, is that children make up a very small portion of the total burden of COVID disease. So in, around, in the US, it's around 2%, a similar um, in China, it's a little bit lower in Italy and Spain. And most of the cases in, in China, China has, since China started this whole, you know, um, kind of, research and um, evaluating and doing contact tracing earlier than the rest of the world did because they had cases you know, before we did. They, they were able to determine that most of their cases um, in children had a confirmed household contact. We also knew that COVID disease is less severe in children than it is in adults. So this paper by Dong and colleagues, which was published in Pediatrics just earlier this spring, looked at over 2,000 pediatric patients. Now, about a third of them had lab confirmed, two thirds did not, they were suspect cases. But um, when, you, when you pull this data together, their median age was seven years and almost all had non-severe disease. So, you know, 94% of them had non-severe disease, which has continued to be true throughout this pandemic since the publication of that paper. So when we turn our attention and look at COVID-19 symptoms in adults, this paper, uh, which was published in April from Chow and colleagues, this looked at specifically at Seattle, Washington, which as you know, had a big early on outbreak. And so they were able to amass this data. This was looking specific at healthcare workers within King County, Washington. Most healthcare workers developed fever, cough and myalgias, and up to a third had diarrhea, chills, or shortness of breath. Interestingly, also, they, they looked at healthcare workers um, who worked symptomatic and two thirds did. Um, we know historically that is true. It's true during flu seasons and um, just respiratory viral seasons in general that people tend to come to work even when they're sick. And we know when you compare pediatric COVID symptoms to adult that they're different. So while fever occurs in at least 70% of adults at initiation and even higher if you, if you kind of go into several days into their symptoms, it, only about 56% of children actually develop fever. Um, a fewer percentage have cough, it's a little over half compared to 80% of adults. Um, a very, you know, much smaller number have shortness of breath compared to adults and so on. Also diarrhea, which I know early on got a lot of attention. There's a much lower rate of diarrhea in children than there is in adults. And then this data from MMWR also shows that, you know, graphically, 
whether or not children are hospitalized. And so the black bars show hospitalization rates for children um, based on age. So the leftmost is under one year of age, all the way up to 15 to 17 years of age. And as you can see, there's um, a little bit of a, a bigger trend under the one year of age to be hospitalized. Um, that's true for other respiratory diseases as well. You know, children with RSV, children with young children with flu, and other even paraflu and other respiratory diseases are more likely to be hospitalized than older children are. Um, but a very low rate overall of hospitalization and an even lower rate of ICU admission compared um, to adults. So the symptoms of COVID-19 overlap with a lot of other, other uh, pieces that we see or a lot of other infections that we see in the community, including strep throat and the common cold, um, asthma and allergies, which can make it hard to tease out. And I think in, in part is probably why how some healthcare workers continue to work even with symptoms because they are attributing it to other things. So this paper um, came out recently and has made a lot of news headlines from emerging infectious diseases. And this was looking at contact tracing during coronavirus disease outbreaks in South Korea in, um, this year. And so what they found was that children under the age of 10 were less likely um, to be considered of the index case or the transmitter of infection than were children over the age of 10, 10 through 19, um, who, who were more like adults. Um, this was just within the household. If you look at non-household or outside of the household transmission, it was actually quite low and didn't start to rise until the adult age of 40. You know, the, the interesting piece about this was that this was done when schools were closed, um, so kids were at home. But if you, if the other piece about this is that the young children um, and actually even the older children, the 10 to 19 age group, had fewer contacts than, of course, the adults did. And so it raises the question of which way the, tra the infection was transmitted in the home um, from parent to child or, or child to parent. And, they, and the authors of this study mentioned that they really, they, they don't have the data to be able to make a determination on that. So they just, they had a kind of a best guess, but not really, really knowing which, which direction the infection was transmitted. So re recently, a, another kind of a compilation of studies was published. Um, this is by Goldstein and colleagues from uh, Harvard, and they looked at the effect of age on transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in households. This included the paper from South Korea, it included papers from China, you know, it, it, you know from all over. And what they kind of conclude, two, two of the main points they conclude is that children that are less, less than 10 years of age are less susceptible. And this was found in seven of the nine studies they looked at um, across, across China and Israel that children were less likely to be infected. Um, Two of the nine found no difference. One of those, though, included a whole bunch of travel contacts, and so they, they felt like that data was probably biased. They also looked at infectivity, and they compiled studies that looked at that, and um, basically their conclusion was that children may be less infective or able to transmit a virus. This is based on some um, data from the Netherlands in those under 19 years of age, and then again, the South Korea data. Um, and then I talked about the fewer contact piece with the South Korea da data, so that potentially um, these kids were being infected in the home rather than being the index case. So I wanted to talk for a minute about masks. There's been so much controversy about, about masking since all of this started, and there's been some, some you know, initial um, kind of push that, that maybe masks weren't necessary, and then a huge shift kind of nationally, and then there's you know, just a lot of in-between with some people really believing in this, and then others in the communities you know, not so much adhering to these guidelines as more and more data have come out to show us that it really does make a difference. But this particular MMWR article I thought was useful and illustrative of, of how they do work. So in this uh, paper, there were two uh, hairstylists, both of which who had symptoms of COVID-19, one for six days, one for four, four days. They um, took care of 139 different people while they were working sick. Both hairstylists wore masks and all of the, nearly all of the patrons 
wore masks as well. And no, nobody developed COVID-19 disease. So they were, they followed up with these people. They tested a portion of those. They tested, um, I think in the 70 range of 67 or 70 people out of that 139 contact and nobody had positive um, COVID um, testing results. Additionally, there were, um, you know, no other thought, people thought to have symptoms related to COVID as well. So last week, the CDC came out with a school update, um, you know, titled The Importance of Reopening America's Schools This Fall, and came out with some specific things around how parents and staffs are concerned about safety, um, that, and they talked about, you know, harms attributed to school closures around emotional well-being and, and behavioral health, economics, you know, academic achievement, and so on. And that the lack of in-person education disproportionately harms low-income and minority children and those with disabilities. And then they talked a little bit about the risk of COVID infection in children under 18 years of age. And that while overall they, you know, in some data, they may represent up to 7% of cases. They, they represent a very small portion of deaths. Um, and so far there have been 64 deaths from COVID-19 in children. Um, and this is just in comparison to what a typical flu year looks like, or the range for flu, but a typical flu year is somewhere between 100 and 150. And that perhaps children are not the primary drivers of, of spread in school or in the community. They also recommend that people screen at home. Um, and so they, they provide this little checklist for families um, to do, which includes temperature taking and, and and you know, kind of symptom screening at home. And then also the, another section around close contacts for potential exposures. Children's Mercy also has some school, um, returning to school guidance on the website that has been created by some of my uh, partners in infectious diseases who have spoken in a number of times in a number of forums around um, our Kansas City area recently. Um, we also have a REDCap um, survey database that is for schools to access when they want specific information or want to be kept abreast of up new updates and, and re more recent information as it becomes available. And we've had a number of schools reach out to us uh, and, and early childhood um, centers as well. And this is what the guidance looks like. Then I wanted to put a plug in really quick. Contact tracing is actually important and it sounds kind of daunting, but it's actually not hard to do. It is somewhat time consuming, but there is a free online course from Johns Hopkins University. It takes about six hours. And it's um, something that I think is, you know, um, just something to consider um, getting a little bit of education around this as we look forward, as we look to the future and the possibility of having children on site in schools and what that might look like and how, how we can do this. So in summary, children represent a small portion of COVID-19 infections and typically have more mild symptoms than adults do. Many healthcare workers uh, and likely other people, not just in the healthcare sector, continue to report to work while ill, which is true and has been true for a number of years. Masks and social distancing reduce transmission. There's some good data around that. The CDC and Children's Mercy have developed guidance to help schools um, kind of think through these problems. And uh, as I mentioned, there's free contact tracing training available through, through Johns Hopkins. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Simone Moody, here to present on anxiety and fear and helping kids cope with COVID-19. And I'm a clinical psychologist at Children's Mercy. So the objectives of my presentation today are to help you identify fear and anxiety in the school setting, identify tools to manage anxiety and fear in the school setting. So we'll start with some basic definitions. What are anxiety and fear? Well, um, fear is the emotional response to real or perceived imminent threat 
whereas anxiety is the anticipation of a future threat. And we know that fear and anxiety can be a good thing. So for example, if we see a bear, fear is helpful in producing that emotional response that helps us fight or flight in that situation. Whereas anxiety can be helpful to keep us out of bear caves in the anticipation that a bear might be present. So when are anxiety and fear not good? Well, if that perceived threat is an irrational one, if it's not likely or if it's not an imminent threat. So for example, this may present as children or teens in your schools, catastrophizing or focusing on the worst possible outcomes related to COVID-19. Um, and we know that anxiety and fear are not good in other situations when it's developmentally inappropriate. So if I were to tell you that a child was having trouble separating from their parent to go to school, and then I told you that that child was two years old, that would be developmentally appropriate. If that child was 10 years old, that would be developmentally inappropriate. So we know that anxiety and fear is also not good if the emotional response is maladaptive. So for example, if you have a child who's expressing worries that are significantly more than their peers, and this expression varies from their culture as defined by the child and their family, and it negatively impacts their functioning, such as poor school performance or in other areas of their life, then that would be maladaptive. We know that the intensity of the emotion matters, especially for anxiety when considering if it's good or bad, helpful or not helpful. And we have known for over a century that in many situations, a moderate level of emotional arousal is related to the most favorable performance. And as that emotional arousal level gets lower or higher, we see performance compromised. And we can relate this information to the current pandemic. So we wanna have a moderate level of emotional arousal or anxiety to make us likely to engage in safe practices such as physical distancing, wearing a mask and washing our hands. And if we have low levels of emotional arousal, we're, we're not too concerned about it. We may be less likely to engage in these practices. But on the other hand, if we have too much emotional arousal, it can be counterproductive and in some cases incapacitating. So more broadly touching on COVID-19 and the mental health impact, we know that any significant life stressor leaves us more vulnerable to mental health difficulties. But what's so different about COVID-19 is that it's a pandemic and it's affecting everyone worldwide, some more so than others. And with that, I expect you will see an increase in students with a wide variety of mental health concerns. So I list some of those here, anxiety and fear, which is the focus of my presentation today. Also children who have experienced trauma or grief, children who are having disruptive behavior problems, especially they've been out of school for several months and then they're transitioning to a new kind of school. And so we might expect them to have more disruptive behaviors. And then also students who have experienced or are experiencing now depression um, because they're facing certain life situations uh, and their social support networks and coping skills have been shifted because of the pandemic. And I encourage all of you to pay, pay special attention to students who are known to have pre-existing mental health conditions or those who have experienced significant stressors as these populations are really the most vulnerable to the mental health impact. So anxiety and fear are captured in a variety of different mental health disorder categories, including anxiety disorders, trauma and stressor related disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. And in this slide, I list how symptoms of these disorders may present in the school nurse setting. So you may be seeing kids who are excessively worrying about the, themselves or others getting sick, or maybe it's other kinds of worries that they're presenting with. You may see students who are escaping or avoiding school activities or interactions with others. Certainly you'll see a lot of somatic complaints, headaches and stomach aches that come through your office. And then to a lesser degree, degree, you may see some kids who are experiencing panic attacks, which are abrupt and intense, short-lived sort of anxiety outbursts. And again, this is less common in younger children and more likely in your older students and teens. So I just wanna briefly go over panic attack symptoms. There's a total of 13 possible 
symptoms and the reason why I'm talking about it to this audience is because 10 out of those 13 symptoms are physiological in nature and some actually overlap with COVID-19 symptoms. So as a school health professional, if you expect a child is experiencing a a panic attack, you want to, of course, rule out any medical cause and then monitor that child's symptoms over time to see if they persist. So we know anxiety and fear are more likely to increase going back to school. So what can you do about it? Well, the evidence-based treatment for anxiety and fear-related disorders is grounded in cognitive behavioral therapy. And CBT teaches an individual and their support network how to turn down the volume or the intensity of that anxiety and fear by replacing maladaptive thoughts and behaviors with adaptive ones. So in the next few slides, I'll review cognitive behavioral strategies that you can use as a school nurse or school staff member to help your students manage anxiety and fear. Okay, so how I design these slides on the left is the skill that uh, you can use and on the right is some examples on how you can use that skill. So the first skill is inquiring and listening to your students. And you wanna do this in a way that prompts them to tell you more in a way that's open-ended and non-judgmental. So for example, tell me more about how you feel or what happened or how can I help you? And then as you're listening, it's important to validate their feelings and normalize those feelings as it's appropriate. So it sounds like you're worried about getting sick. Well, there are many other students that feel that way and that can kind of help them feel more connected and like they're not alone with these concerns. And then if it's possible, trying to make some reasonable accommodations. So if you're listening to them and really what they're wanting is just a break from their mask, trying to find a safe place for them to do that at the school can be helpful. Or maybe they're sitting in their class and one of their um, students that sits next to them is not so great at you know, keeping their mask on or they're fidgeting a lot and that's making that student anxious and they just would like a different seat in the classroom. You may be able to coordinate that with their teacher. Moving on, as you're talking with them, it can be helpful to remind the student of the health and safety practices that you have in place at your school. So remember, we're working to protect everyone by X, Y, and Z, but you really wanna avoid excessive reassurance that they're, they're okay, because that can create more anxiety and they think, well, there, there must be something that I need to be uh, afraid of if they keep focusing on how we're safe. So um, those can be helpful strategies. It can also be helpful to try to shift the discussion a little bit away from the anxiety and help kids change the channel in their brain from the anxious channel to a more positive channel. So engaging them in discussion about what their favorite activity is to do at school, what they miss most about school in the spring and the summer can help connect them in a more positive way to school. For some kids, they may not have some good experiences at school and that's okay. And you may talk about other areas outside of school to help distract their brain. Next is uh, limiting attention to anxious behavior. So as school health professionals, your intuition is to rescue, right, and to help. And um, that's important in a lot of ways, but for anxiety, it can be counterproductive. And so you wanna avoid reasoning with the anxiety. You wanna avoid commenting on anxious behaviors that you're seeing. And instead you wanna give students a, a safe place to self-calm. So, if you're trying some of these skills and you're noticing that it's actually escalating the student's anxious behavior, that might be a good signal to say, hey, I'm just gonna take a step back, let's sit down, and um, when you're calm and ready to engage, then we'll, we'll talk and just kind of giving them a safe place to do that. And when they're calm, or sometimes even at early signs of anxiety, or if you know that a student's prone to being anxious, it can be helpful to teach relaxation skills. So I listed a few up here. It's not an all-encompassing list, but these are the ones that I find to be most helpful in working with kids and teens. And the first is belly breathing. The second is guided imagery where students are imagining themselves in a certain situation and really talking about the details and um, feelings they might have in that situation to help kind of relax their body. And then the last one is progressive muscle relaxation, which teaches people how to tense and relax different body groups. 
And so I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about belly breathing. One of my colleagues, Dr. Mark Connolly, developed um, these a few relaxation videos I include as a resource in these slides here. And what I really like about um, this video that we're going to practice together in just a minute is it's animated. It's helpful across different stages of development. I like it, and I'm a grown-up. Um, and it really demonstrates the technique that you're supposed to use. So we're going to watch a hot air balloon expand. And as that hot air balloon expands, our belly is going to expand with it. And then um, as that hot air balloon contracts and goes down, our belly is going to contract and go down with it. And then there's a little marker on the side of the video that helps guide you on when to inhale and when to exhale. It might be difficult to read, but that's just on the right over here. So let's see if I can get this working. Get cozy and comfortable, and we will practice. Okay, breathe in. Belly expands. Breathe out. Belly contracts. Breathe in. Belly expands. Breathe out. Belly contracts. Let's do one more. Breathe in. Belly expands. Breathe out. Belly contracts. Okay, let me see if I can off. Okay. Well, now we're feeling relaxed and we can move on to our next skill. Um, so helping students create accurate and helpful self-talk. So this, of course, would be a skill that you would implement when a child is calm and helping them fight back those worry thoughts that they have. Um, but you want to make them believable to the child. If they don't believe it, they're not going to work. So I'm doing my best to say safe by X, Y, and Z or really having them identify, this is my worry brain talking. It's making my body feel bad. And so I can do X, Y, and Z to relax. Oh, apparently the video still wants to play. All right, moving on. Um, as children are and students are using these coping skills and demonstrating appropriate behavior if they're anxious in your office, we really want to praise them for that. And the praise helps increase the likelihood of that behavior in the future. So great deep breath. Thanks for sharing your feelings with me. Nice job talking back to the worry are all examples of ways that you can praise your students. And if you notice, the praise is really specific to the behavior that you like that they're doing. And then as a um, school health professional or other school staff member, it's really important to model calm behavior and coping. So if you're around someone who is anxious, like a student, sometimes you can kind of take on some of that anxiety too and not notice it. So just kind of checking yourself, making sure that you're relaxed, you're speaking in a calm level at an appropriate voice level. And the best way to really model that calm behavior and coping is by practicing relaxation along with them. And that helps normalize the skill. Moving on, it's important um, the best that you can to try to prevent escape and avoidance of the anxious response. And my number one recommendation on how to do that would be to keep students at school if there's no other medical reason or serious reason why they need to leave school. So if it's just because they're anxious, we want to keep them at school. If we send them home, that reinforces the anxiety. We know that one of our most effective behavioral tools for anxiety is exposure to anxiety. And so um, we don't want to keep them in necessarily in their classroom setting if they're very, very escalated, if they need a break in your office, that's OK. But it's important to try to set some limits on those breaks and make sure they're really using them wisely to self-calm or work on some coping skills. And then the ultimate goal would be to send them back to the classroom or the activity that they're supposed to be doing. I know that many of you get frequent flyers to your office for anxiety and fears, lots of somatic complaints and the like. Um, for these kiddos, it can be helpful to work with the teacher and their parents to develop some goals for their time in the, in the school nurse's office. So for example, if you have a child who's coming into your office on average two or three times a day, you might set a goal for that child to come into the school nurse two or fewer times in a day. And if they meet that goal, then they get to play a game with their teacher at the end of the day, or maybe they get access to a special privilege at home in the evening with their parents. Um, and really, over time, as they're um, feeling more confident about their ability to stay in the classroom, you could gradually challenge them a little bit more. 
In severe cases of anxiety, you may see students or not see students um, who have a lot, a lot of school avoidance and maybe they're not even getting out of the car to go to school or they're stuck at home. And so for these students, it would be helpful to work with your school team on developing a gradual reintegration plan where they're coming to school at first for short periods of time and then gradually extending the length of their day. And then lastly, I'm sure you all are very familiar with care coordination. That's really important for anxiety and fear manage management, making sure that you're communicating with parents and school staff about the students that are coming into your office with anxiety and fear, and then trying to find ways to connect the family to resources. And that might be within the school um, with a variety of different school mental health professionals, or maybe it's outside of the school and letting them know that it might be helpful to talk more with your pediatrician to get further evaluated or get connected with resources or connecting them with a mental health professional outside of the school that they work with already or uh, establishing care somewhere else. Okay, and on this next slide, I just list some more resources about anxiety and fear if you're interested. Um, some of them are specific to COVID-19 and the pandemic, so they may be helpful to you. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. I'm Shelby Rebeck. I'm the Director of Health Services for the Shawnee Mission School District. And um, before I get started, I really wanna thank um, Athenis and Angie uh, for hosting again, a wonderful conference. I know this was the first virtual one, so I always learn something here. And um, so a special shout out to Dr. Moody because um, I could really relate to your trauma slides. I have been personally traumatized by COVID <laughs> and uh, I uh, have had panic attacks, I'm pretty sure. And um, so I'm gonna practice that belly breathing. Thank you for that. So I'm just kidding here, but I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I think there were days this summer when uh, this is what our plan to return to school looked like. In my district, we decided early on in the planning stages that we were going to ground ourselves in the science and not be swayed by the politics surrounding this public health crisis. So last week, when these slides were created, this is what was going on in my county. Johnson County was up to 4,381 cases, and as you saw today, we're at 4,800 cases, the most of all counties in Kansas. We had been named a red zone state by the White House for having more than 100 new cases per 100,000 population. And Georgia Tech developed a tool showing that currently in Johnson County, if you're at an event with 100 people, there's a 92% chance that one person there has COVID. As you recall back in April, the White House developed criteria supported by the CDC stating we need to show a 14-day downward trend prior to re, uh, proceeding with a phased reopening. And this is what was happening in Johnson County. We did well in April and May after stay-at-home orders were implemented, but starting the first part of June, we saw increases in large gatherings, people weren't social distancing, and wearing masks somehow became an issue of a constitutional right versus doing what's right during a public health crisis. This chart shows Johnson County's non-long-term care facility percent positive tests at 9.4%. Again, this data was from last week. This next slide shows new cases reported each day in Johnson County, showing we did well in April and May, but our case numbers were abysmal for June and July. At the same time this data was trending in the wrong direction countywide, our school district was surveying our parents, asking for their thoughts on returning to school. 
This data is from early in the survey and showed our families were split down the middle regarding online learning versus in-person. I'd like to draw your attention to the third statement on the, right, on the right side that says, children are at low risk for serious harm from the virus. I believe the children will be okay, even if returning to in-person schooling. And, and the data we have, it, that's an accurate s statement with what we have right now. I think the problem is that the teachers um, still feel scared. We, we, don't, we still need a lot of information um, for the impact returning to school on our staff. So we did survey our staff at the time, asking if they were comfortable returning to in-person work. As you can see, it was a pretty mixed bag with slightly more leaning toward not being comfortable returning to work. Through that same survey, we also learned that 42% of our licensed or what we call certified staff members reported having a high risk condition for COVID. And 58% of our unlicensed personnel, so that would be our paras, our food service staff, custodial maintenance, they reported being high risk. So based on what we learned from the surveys, we believed that a safe learning and working environment was the key. So we got to work. While we still don't know everything we need to know about COVID-19, and I will specifically mention transmission data, we need the data to make better decisions, and we still don't have good pediatric testing programs in place in our county, which school nurses really feel like they need. What we do know, however, from the science and feel comfortable with are that these mitigating measures work. Stay home when you're sick, personal distance of six feet or greater, wear a mask properly, covering your nose and your mouth, hand hygiene, 20 seconds of soap and water or hand sanitizer when a sink isn't available, clean or disinfect high touch surfaces frequently, and cohort, or stay in those small static groups and limit the mixing. These mitigating measures are the backbone of our return to school plan. Everything we do in our buildings will incorporate these mitigating measures. So when we ask staff, if we install hand sanitizer stations, enforce reasonable social distancing, and have mask requirements, would that increase your comfort level in returning to work? It was clear that that was helpful. Most people agreed with that. When we asked if everyone was required to wear a mask and cleaning standards were maintained, then we saw some uncertainty. And you can imagine these teachers in the schools they know that this is gonna be difficult for kids. And I think it comes to mind young kids when I say this, but some of our middle school and high school kids are gonna struggle with that mask requ requirement as well. We've seen a lot of our males, middle school and high school, not wanting to wear a mask. Even with mitigating measures in place, when asked about returning to work, there is still a lot of concern among staff for the safety of themselves and others. And I have to tell you, this is a hard pill to swallow. You want your staff to feel comfortable. You want them to come to work because we don't want their anxiety to be projected to the kids. We want everybody there um, comfortable in their work environment. So this was difficult. We also asked parents if they had to choose that day, which instructional model would they choose? You can see about 25% across all levels, pre-K through 12th grade, said online. That's the green bar. An average of just over 30% said a blended model where their student would come to school for two days per week and learn online for three days per week. That's the blue bar. And then just over 40% of parents said they would choose full online in-person learning. That's reflected in the orange bar. This was a really good sample size, an N of 15,598 as we have 27,000 students in our district. Some of course are from the same family. 
From this data, we knew we had to develop robust in-person and online instructional models. So this is our instructional model. Parents can choose from option one or two. Option one on the left is in-person learning. In-person learning is based on gating criteria established by the County Health Department. If county data continues to trend in the wrong direction, we will remain online. Once the county data reaches a point that it is safe to begin small in-person learning, we'll move to the hybrid model, which is the two days in school for the alpha last name letters A through L, and then um, that they would attend on Monday and Tuesday, and then the other half of the alpha letters M through Z would attend on Wednesday, Thursday. Everyone would be online Friday, except for maybe small groups who really need that extra in person. When and if county data reaches a point that we can return, we will go back on site full capacity in person learning. Option two on your right is online the entire first semester with the capability of reevaluating at semester. In this instructional model, nobody is on our campuses unless the health department says it's safe. So knowing we could have staff and students on campus in a hybrid model, if gating criteria supported it, departments got to work on making that happen in the safest manner possible. For my department, that meant creating educational information and FAQs, helping people understand the importance of mitigating measures and that you wear PPE when it's indicated, not out of fear. At the time of creating these slides, we were still waiting on guidance for temperature checks, isolation, and quarantine, and at that time, exactly what the gating criteria was gonna be. The facilities department has, among other things, purchased atomizing misters and installed hand sanitizers in all of our classrooms. We have an excellent partnership with Children's Mercy, Luke Gard, uh, with indoor air quality, and our HVAC vendor for guidance related to air quality and ventilation. Facilities will be responsible for water quality concerns, drinking fountains, and district-wide signage, placing those in all of our buildings. And at the time uh, of creating these slides, we were awaiting the Kansas High School Athletics Association to provide additional guidance this week, which that did come out, and they uh, elected to start athletics back on August 17th, um, which we are all very concerned about as we plan a September 8th start date. Transportation will follow cleaning and disinfection protocols similar to our facilities plan. Masks will be available to students on buses in the event one is needed. Seating charts will be implemented on day one based on enrollments. Students will load the bus and fill the back seats first, unload the front to avoid unnecessary mingling. Um, buses will unload one at a time to avoid all that crowding that you see at the front of schools and social distance on the bus whenever possible. And on lighter bus routes, they will spread out. Food Services has done, done some creative work around streamlining meal delivery and eating in flex spaces. Outside, we um, had a principal say that she was gonna have um, beach towels and, and her students would each be on a beach towel to eat their lunches socially distanced. I like that idea. The technology department has purchased an entirely new learning management system that assists with the need to transition from in-person to online learning easier, as well as multiple initiatives to support working and learning from home. So while I certainly didn't list all departments, you can imagine the work human resources has had to do, as well as our legal team, curriculum and instruction, communications, the list is really endless. Although I featured these departments, every department has put in countless hours this summer preparing for staff and students to work and learn in the safest manner possible. While there has been a great deal of thoughtful planning taking place this year, I want you all to consider this. School districts cannot be expected to do it all. We recognize that schools serve a daycare need 
We feed children breakfast and lunch five days a week. We have social workers and counselors and school nurses on staff to address mental and physical health needs. But perhaps our communities should start addressing these issues outside of the educational setting. Perhaps childcare, food, mental and physical health should have its own place in our community and not rely so heavily on our educational institutions for these services. Schools love supporting kids and their families, but the pressure to get back to in-person learning has in some cases been driven by these societal shortcomings. And you know, if I can just tell you the behind the scenes conversations uh, with our school district administrators and not just Shawnee Mission, this is you know across the nation, we want uh, our staff and our students back safely. And, and we want to do all the things that we normally do. But right now, there's really no one who sees that we're go going to go back to our old normal here in the next you know, month or two. This is a long-term problem that we're going to likely be online sometimes depending on what the virus does. So these are things that I just um, really think that our community in general needs to address. And so I will close with the statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics which states we must pursue reopening in a way that is safe for all students, teachers, and staff. Public health officials must make recommendations based on the evidence, not politics. And we should leave it to health experts to tell us when to open schools and then listen to the educators to shape how we do that. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna have our three presenters come to the front. They each have their own seat and microphone, and we will allow you, we'll have Athenas read off the questions again, and each of you can answer as it, as it comes up. All right, so the first one may have been for our previous presenters, which if we are not able to get this answered, we can follow up with the diabetes provider but it states, are you recommending diabetic students attend in-person school this year? Any additional precautions? If schools um, have are are having in-person classes and a family, you know, again, this is, you know, a family decision as well as to whether they feel like their child should be in person or not. Um, there isn't, a reason from you know necessarily a medical standpoint that a child with diabetes couldn't attend school provided the family felt safe and comfortable and the school was holding in-person classes. And the next question is the same one about currently recommending in-person education for diabetic students of all ages. And I'm assuming that is what you had stated with it. But then I'll just tag on to that, yeah. that um, we've had lots of parent phone calls asking our advice and our judgment uh, about what they should do. Should we go in person? Should we go online? And this is what I tell people. There is no universal right. Mm -hmm. um, your, your gut feeling as a parent and making that decision in conjunction with your child, that's the right answer. So we've really tried to impress upon people you know, please don't feel guilty. Please don't shame people who choose to go in person or, or, or vice versa. This is a very personal decision. Thank you. Our students will be required to wear masks when we return in the fall. Do you have recommendations on how to store or secure their masks when they are not being worn? Examples, during recess or while eating, they will be required to wear the masks while they're in the halls to these locations so they will not be able to leave them secured in the classroom. So in our district, um, many of our principals have purchased breakaway lanyards mm -hmm. that keep the mask um, just right on the person. And then others I think have done some um, paper bags, decorated paper bags or plastic bags. 
So um, yeah, certainly those will be challenges. So I, I would advocate for the for the um, paper bag piece. Just in thinking in thinking about this, the other thing that's actually really important is hand hygiene. So you should you should use hand hygiene before you put your mask on, and then you should use hand hygiene again before you take it off, so that your hands aren't contaminating the mask. And that's particularly hard for for young children. So like maybe. A, a you know a 30 second pause or time out in the classroom where everybody does hand hygiene and then takes off their mask puts it in their bag or the lanyard piece um, it, and then again when they go to put them back on mm -hmm. any suggestions or recommendations for setting up an isolation room at school So um, in, in terms of children who might have COVID symptoms or for aerosol generating procedures, I'm not, I'm not completely sure, but it's, a, it's definitely a good idea if you have a child who has COVID-like illness who comes to the nurse's office to separate them out from the rest of the ch children who might just be in the nurse's office to take their meds or for other reasons. And so having a separate room, if possible, off of the nurse's station or nurse's office is a great idea if that's, if that's feasible. If not, then you know partitioning a place off um, for a sick child would also be a good idea um, so that there's still an adult who you know, can monitor that child Child, but that, that they're not in, you know, with the, with the rest of the kids who may be kind of filing through the nurse's office. Our county health department is giving us protocols for when we need to isolate a student or staff member and what that isolation um, room needs to look like. And then as far as procedures, um, we are not doing any procedures that require um, an N95 or personal protective equipment that we don't have access to at this time. Um, so we are working with the patient, with the students, and with their primary care physicians to eliminate uh, procedures that we just don't have the PPE for. And this comment goes to the previous question. We plan to have lanyards for each elementary student to attach the mask to and then teaching to, to tuck into their shirts at lunch. Are children a low burden due to early isolation? You mean early, would, you mean in the spring, early shutdowns of schools or, I, I don't completely yeah. understand wh where that's, what that question is. Mm -hmm. And I, I do wanna add to the, I, I forgot to mention earlier on the previous question about the isolation room in the school, in the guidance for school reopening, our infectious disease team did help work on a section for the isolation room, so that might be also beneficial to reference to. And please define what insulin factor sensitivity is. Do we know the numbers of youth complications related to COVID-19? Right, the second part is, do we know the numbers of youth complications related to COVID-19? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a great um, question. And I actually didn't put the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children data in, in this slide deck. I actually took it out. I had it in and took it out. Um, but the CDC has some really good um, data on that that they have shown from across the country, the number of kids that have been reported, um, and then also, you know, race-related data as well. It, you know, it's a very small portion of those who develop COVID-19 infection, and um, an even smaller proportion of those kids, you know, um, die. We've not had any deaths here. We've taken care of, you know, a little over a handful of kids with multi-system inflammatory syndrome and all have done, you know, pretty well. So yes, there's some data on it. The CDC has some, has some good data um, that, and we can also share it out as well. Best PPE for school nurses, masks and face shields, Masks and face shields, yes, when you'll be up close, and or goggles. And, yeah, go ahead. This is fun. I can just say really quickly that 
Um, Children's Mercy providers are all wearing masks and face shields as well, even myself as a psychologist when we're seeing patients. Mm -hmm. And not a question, but they included a link to the John Hopkins contact tracing site. I do wanna add that that same link is also added in the school guidance for reopening that we were able to include as well. And at Venice, I'll tag on to that. Mm -hmm. In Johnson County, uh, the County Health Department is training all Johnson County school nurses to be contact tracers for our own building. So if we have a staff member test positive, we wouldn't be responsible for contact tracing, like say if they went to church, but we're responsible for contact tracing within our buildings so that that notification can go out in a timely manner and we can get those who were potentially exposed out to keep our numbers down. That's great to know. How important is it to wear a mask when a teacher is in their own room, when students are not in their room at the moment, but are in the building? Yeah, that's a great question. So at Children's Mercy, if you have an office, what we, how we say it is with a ceiling and a door, and you are by yourself, then you don't need to have your mask on. Otherwise, if you are in a shared office space or a cubicle space or you're you know, taking care of patients directly, um, you need to have your mask on. And if you're taking care of patients, also your eye protection. Can you clarify an exposure? Shouldn't the whole class be declared exposed if a classmate tests positive? They will have, time, they will have times that their mask will be off. Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends, I think, you know, when their masks are off and how long they're off together. You know, different health departments are um, determining different ways what constitutes exposure. So, um, and some are, are even um, looking at it from different time frames. So the CDC says closer than six feet for 15 minutes or more. Um, and they don't, you know, comment on the masking piece, you know, whether or not masks are being worn by both parties. But different health departments around Kansas City have determined it a little bit differently. So the best way to know that is to check in with your county health department. Mm -hmm. My daycare has kids from six weeks to pre-K age, so around five. They have all staff wear masks, but don't want kids wearing them. My four-year-old wants to wear hers. Should I be concerned despite the possible decreased risk in the younger children? Is this commonplace in the daycare setting or should I be speaking with the daycare about my changes, about making changes? Yeah, so the CDC has come out and said that kids under two shouldn't be wearing masks. I would also add that kids who are taking naps should not be wearing a mask while they're napping. It's just not a good safety measure. Um, if your child is wanting to wear a mask, hey, that's awesome, you know, go for it. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's completely reasonable to have a conversation with the daycare about it if you're concerned. You, you know, each each individual daycare, school, and school district, and you know, are make are kind of developing their own guidance and their own rules. And we do know that young children are are less likely to transmit infection, and it appears even less likely than than older children. And so I think, you know, people's guidelines continue to change as the data continues to evolve. And that's I think been a, a real struggle for us all, um, a, you know, within in our Kansas City community, but across the nation. We are not used to having to make this many changes this rapidly around anything. And um, people that, you know, outside of, you know, um, nursing and physicians and the medical field in general um, aren't used to seeing the data of medical studies so prominent in the media so often, and I'm sure it, people have whiplash. I mean, literal whiplash because of it. And so I think the best thing to do, that's a long-winded answer to say, staying in touch with your daycare and continuing to have ongoing conversations about it is really helpful. I have two kids currently in daycare. I sent them back in um, June, I believe. And once the indoor mask policy came into place pretty much, um, at least in my county, uh, all of the daycare providers were wearing masks, but the kids aren't wearing masks. And from a developmental perspective, I think that's okay. And the data and science obviously backs that up too. Again, if the child's wanting to wear a mask, that's great. If they're, you know, you're wanting them to wear a mask and they don't want to, then that may be a time when you would um, talk to them about it. Or if they start wearing their mask and they're bothered by it, then you might consider a different route. 
What kind of PPE is needed for staff working with complex care, medically fragile students who are not going to be wearing a mask? Right, again, so it all depends on exactly what, what you're doing to care for that child. Um, it sounds like in the Shawnee Mission School District, there aren't gonna be aerosol generating procedures like um, uh, nebulized treatments and things of that nature. So N95s really aren't necessary, but eye protection in the mask is for sure necessary in that setting. Are table fans discouraged at school to help improve ventilation? And I can actually answer to this because this question has been brought up in our, uh, in our little request link for school assistance. And right now, experts are recommending against the use of portable fans because they may disturb or alter existing airflow patterns, which may increase exposure potential for room occupants. So it's just important to keep in mind that schools are having to maintain their HVAC system. And once you start disturbing with different airflow patterns, which would come from a fan or a window, then that may make it more difficult uh, for those patterns to work. And I would add to that, that um, I've been back to work for two weeks now in the district. And because the HVAC systems are pulling in more fresh outdoor air and it's been so humid, um, we have more people wanting to use a fan in the district. And I've had to say, no, no, please don't. Mm -hmm. The large scale study from South Korea article from New York Times July 18th showed that teens and older children ages 10 to 18 spread COVID-19 at least as frequently as adults. Was this study included in the last presenter slides? Are your, are you return to school recommendations, are your return to school recommendations different for middle and high school students? Yeah, they were included in my slides. I did talk about it. So just two things. Yes, that's what that data showed. But remember, they couldn't tell the direction of transmission in that study. They didn't. They were not able to know who was the index case in that household. So the so the direction of transmission could have been the older teen or child to the to the parent, or it could have been vice versa. Number two, this was done during a time when schools were closed. And if you look at the table, table two from that paper. Those kids, the young kids and even the older kids had fewer, far fewer contacts than the adults did. So presumably at least some of those cases attributed from child to adult transmission were actually the other direction because the adults had far more contacts in the community than the kids did because they were at home. So, you know, it, it's one piece of the data and it's helpful data, but it, no, nothing we have so far gives us an entire picture and no one study will be able to give us an entire picture. And I know that that's incredibly frustrating because this is how it moves incrementally, but it does it does provide us some some helpful data, um, and there's you know some other studies around that as well. And then the second part of that is um, in our district, we are currently not going to separate out um, the under 10 and the older than 10 because logistically that would be very difficult. I think a 10 year old is around a fourth grader and in our district, fourth, fifth and sixth grade are still elementary students. So logistically, now I'm not gonna say that down the line we might not do that. It really depends on how long um, all of these measures need to take place. We may look at doing things differently in the future, but right now we're going to start off slow and um, do everything the same. Looking for wisdom on one, sorting out COVID from other illnesses that have similar symptoms. We can send kids home, but what if parents decline to test for COVID? Two, would you recommend doctor's notes or proof of negative COVID to return to the in-person school environment? concerned about argumentative, non-compliant, uncooperative parents? Great question. So um, the CDC actually doesn't recommend testing to be required to return to school. So I, I would not recommend a requirement. Um, I do think if kids have symptoms, you know, related to COVID or concerning for COVID and they're sent home from school, then yes, they need to be in contact with their provider, end of story. Whether that's a telehealth visit or an in-person visit or, you know, what have you, you know, that that's between the provider and the parent and the child. Um, and then and 
obviously in terms of an alternative diagnosis be you know being made you know we need to look at other things right so you know we will be having flu we will be having RSV we will be having other respiratory viruses in addition to you know strep throat is highest in the winter and early spring months so I do think that they need to be evaluated. I think we need to, we either need to um, decide, look, this doesn't look like COVID, we think it's this alternative diagnosis, or we think this do looks like potentially COVID, and then make a decision about testing from there. But I don't think an, we should have a negative test to return to school. Um, we, we are not requiring negative tests to return to work after people have been positive. And in fact, the CDC has come out with guidance around that after people have a positive test result. You know, they really removed that guidance around the negative testing and the two testing to two tests 24 hours apart it's really all about the time based of 10 days and 24 hours without fever and our county is working with Children's Mercy to develop those isolation guidelines and what we call exclusion guidelines. So to tell us when you need to exclude a student. And I liked the verbiage that one of the county health department um, epidemiologists used and it was the symptoms in absence of another reason or in absence of another cause. So the school nurses, they'll be really good at discerning. They know these kids. That's what is so valuable about school nurses. They've had these kids multiple years. They've had their siblings. Um, so a lot of our school nurses know these kids personally, know what symptoms they normally present with. So we'll be looking at those new symptoms uh, for exclusion word in there, so I'm just going to comment um, on angry parents. And so I think the important thing in all of that is that schools are just really clear about what the expectations and the steps are. And so if you're thinking of these really great, great questions, please share them with your um, school administrators so that they can be thinking of them too, and you can come up with pr procedures and make those very clear to your families. Thank you. And I was just going to add as well, back to the school the guidance for schools reopening. There's actually under Appendix B a table that helps provide some guidance that helps discern between what are considered high risk symptoms of COVID-19 versus the more moderate risk symptoms because as mentioned already, a lot of these symptoms do overlap with other health conditions and they do provide uh, some guidance on being able to determine if there needs to be a quarantine or isolation. And please, if you have more direct questions about it, to go ahead and feel free and submit those through the COVID-19 school assistance request that we have available on our webpage. And my officer does not have a window and last year my off, my, sorry, my office does not have a window and last year my office was looked at by facilities and it was found that it also does not have adequate uh, outtake ventilation. It does not work at all. And they could not figure out how to fix it. What would be recommended to help improve the ventilation or is there something that could be done? Fans, air, purifier. I, I did state for this question, unless you all have something else to add that it may be beneficial to submit that question through our COVID-19 school assistance request because then we can have our environmental health experts be able to respond to that. And will the presentation be available in a PDF form? And the answer to that will be a yes. We will have that on our school health support webpage where we will not only have the recording but also have the uh, PDF format. And I received some new questions while we've started this. How are schools handling temperature checks? Wow, that's a tough one. The CDC guidance does not recommend mass temperature checks in schools, neither does the American Academy of Pediatrics, and neither does our county, Johnson County Health Department. Uh, logistically, if I were to check, um, just say we're in the hybrid model, 13,000 some odd kids, and on a daily basis, we would have 3,900 employees in our district. You're talking, you know, 70 hours or more of temperature checks. Um, and then what we, what we heard today is not every child runs a fever or not every person who tests positive runs a fever with it. So 
Um, it's a difficult decision. The governor came out with temperature check recommendations. We were all shocked by that because we didn't feel that it, all of our other recommendations we've agreed with, but we didn't feel that that one was based and grounded in the science. So it's been difficult. At this moment in time, my school district is not going to do temperature checks, but what we are going to do is offer a daily COVID self-assessment for parents to do at home with their child, staff to do at home, and that if there's any um, anyone who makes it to school, the younger grades are gonna, the teachers are gonna do a thumbs up, thumbs down, kind of visual inspection of the kids. Anyone who's a thumbs down or the teacher is concerned about uh, gets an email to the nurse, and then the nurses are gonna make morning rounds and um, check on those kiddos. Can you give advice on how to triage the kids while at school for COVID-19 versus other illnesses? Is there a, tri a triage tree diagram? Just wondering when a student should be sent home other than fever. Yeah, that's a great question. So at the at the end of the, one of the appendices at the end of the school-based um, guidance that was created uh, by the, by um, folks here at Children's Mercy has a very nice color-coded table. I love colors because it helps like separate things out. So versus, you know, having one high-risk symptom versus having two or more, you know, other symptoms related to COVID infection. You know, interestingly, um, a lot of people have had the anosmia or the, you know, the, the loss of smell ability and haven't realized that that's actually more specific for COVID infection than than other viral infections. And so I would I wanted to make a particular note about that, that that's considered like a high risk symptom along with a cough and shortness of breath. So um, so at any rate, I think that that table will be helpful. It's not perfect. And there is overlap in symptoms. And so there is going to be some judgment call on your part, um, on the part of the family, on the part of the, you know, the primary care physician who takes care of this patient as well. But um, I do think it provides some help to kind of kind of walk through the process. Some students will need aerosolized treatments such as suctioning. How will that be, be done safely? What we've done this summer is we have had the school nurses reach out to those students that are known to have those procedures, the nebulizers and the suctioning, and work with the family, with the family's primary care physician to eliminate the need for that. And then what will happen if we cannot eliminate the need? Then um, there maybe there's an option that we can take them outdoors, you know, under a covered awning type thing with an extension cord or whatever we need to do for some of those procedures. Um, but most all of the physicians so far uh, have been wonderful working with us. Say we totally understand um, the county health department just doesn't have the capacity to provide for the fit testing and the cleaning of that. We can get the N95 masks. It's the fit testing and the cleaning that's difficult. And so if we absolutely have to do it, then we will send that school nurse to the county health department and she will receive an N95 mask. And, and then again, it would likely be done in an outdoor um, type setting. If cohorting and physical distancing, how do you feel about masks being off during class? So, you know, um, I, I, I think most of the schools have come out saying that kids are gonna be wearing masks in school. Um, and I, you know, support that. I do recognize that kids, you know, it's gonna be hard for kids to wear masks all day. And I don't think they should be wearing them in PE class. I don't think they should be wearing them at recess um, in times where they're physically active or obviously at eating lunch. And I think that they're gonna need some breaks. I mean, there's just no getting around it. Um, and while I think that the physical distancing and the cohorting are very big pieces, I think that the masking piece also plays a role. And we've seen what happens even in people with symptoms, um, when everybody is masked, transmission doesn't occur. That breaks up that ability to transmit infection. So there, there's definitely a role for masks. And I think each, 
you know, each grade is a little bit different, right? Because the kids' developmental stages are a little bit different. Um, and even within a grade, there's different levels of, <laughs> of development within kids. And so, you know, I think we have to try to approach it um, with some common sense and some knowledge that this is gonna be hard and we're gonna try to make it as fun as possible and we're gonna try to, you know, really think about what the kids um, can, can and can't do. having trouble, just paying attention to when they're having trouble, if there are any patterns to it, to see if there are some solutions that you can come up with to take safe breaks from the mask, individually or as a group. Are we still following immunization schedule for students? We absolutely need to be, and, it, and, and I know you are all very big advocates for this, but this is a year that we need to get everybody to get their flu shot. So I just wanted to put that little plug. We don't have flu vaccine available yet. Um, it will be coming, you know, um, hopefully in September, but every year, you know, this is a struggle. I know it's a struggle for school nurses. It's a struggle for us in the healthcare system as well to convince people that they need to get their flu shot. And this, we absolutely have to be on top of it uh, this year. I would say the last thing we want is outbreaks of other disease, vaccine preventable diseases with COVID. I mean, I think that would just put some of us over the edge. <laughs> and do we need to send siblings home if we have a student present with COVID-like symptoms? And I believe this next question is similar to it. If a student is sent home to quarantine due to an exposure to COVID-19 at school, does that student's family also need to quarantine? So, um if a sib like so, we have two siblings in a school, and um, they're in different grades and different classrooms, and one has symptoms and the other does not. I would I would allow the other sibling to stay in school, and you know obviously continue all the precautions that that school is doing with distancing and masking and frequent hand hygiene and the whole deal. Um, in terms of the parents, I mean, you know clearly somebody is staying home with a sick child when they are ill, um, but. It really, it, the, and the health department will provide guidance on what the parent needs to do in terms of quarantining at home. And so, you know, it's really not our, our recommendation from Children's Mercy or even, you know, so much the school as it is, as it is the health department that makes that, you know, decision for, for the parents. I would add to that. So, um, as Dr. Meyer stated earlier, some common sense is gonna apply here. So if we have a kiddo who presents at one in the afternoon with a fever, cough, and loss of sense of taste or smell, then it is likely at that point that we would exclude the household contacts, the siblings. However, if we have a student who has a headache, body aches, and a sore throat, it is probably unlikely. So I, you know, I think this is gonna be a learning curve for all of us and we'll try to err on the side of caution, but this is, it's gonna be difficult because of the overlapping symptoms of so many things. Most of our buildings um, have window unit ACs, which we have put on the mode to pull in outside air. Should I add some type of air purifier to the isolation area I have created in my nursing office? I will state that in the uh, returning to well, schools reopening guidance that Children's Mercy was able to produce, we have a section on ventilation and specifically with window units. So I highly recommend taking a look at that section. And if that does not help answer your questions, then please submit your question through the COVID-19 school assistance request link. That way we can have environmental health follow up with you. And same with these other questions I've been getting. Would a HEPA filter system be beneficial on a small clinic? I see 50 to 60 kids daily. I would say yes, because I have heard from environmental health often speak about good HEPA filters, MERV rating above 12. Again, refer to the guidance. There is a section on environmental health and if you do have more questions to submit that through the COVID-19 school assistance, just because we don't have environmental health here to <laughs> provide more expert advice. I will keep my doors open should I start closing the door. 
think that's another, or did you have anything to add? I, I think that's more for environmental mm -hmm. health. I, I would like to say that, um, you know, the HEPA filter question has come up within certain clinics within Children's Mercy too, and our environmental services people are not supporting that as a means to, um, you know, shut down rooms for shorter periods of time when, when a COVID patient um, has had an aerosol generating procedure, let's say like a nebulized treatment. So um, I think it is important to actually talk to environmental health and environmental services about that. Um, and it's not to say the HEPA filters aren't good, but you you know there's there's a lot of airflow dynamics that goes into that and you really have to know that it, the product and, and how um, efficient it is. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you recommend an N95 for school nurses since we do deal with students with GI issues and they will need to take off their face coverings? You also said students should wear masks while sleeping. So what about the students who are in the nurse's office wanting to be picked up for um, who fall asleep and have COVID symptoms and signs and symptoms? Yeah, so young children shouldn't who take naps shouldn't be wearing masks while sleeping. Um, the other piece about the N95, so there was a lot of you know, concern and worry early on around GI shedding of COVID-19 that's been able to be found in the stool um, on molecular testing like PCR testing. It's, it's rarely been able to be cultured though. And you know, that's a marker actually of transmissibility and infectivity. So finding genetic pieces of a virus from whether it's from your nose or whether it's you know, from your stool does not mean that it's actually infectious virus. So um, in reality, we do not think that actually stool transmission or fecal oral transmission is really a way that we're passing this virus around, unlike other things, right? Like the enterovirus or um, how we transmit, you know, other, other, you know, bacterial pathogens like Shigella, Salmonella, and things like that. So, so no, for, for, the, for that piece of it, I don't think that N95s are necessary, you know, to care for kids. The other piece is we are not, as, as healthcare workers here, we are taking care of children who generally are not wearing masks. We are wearing eye protection. We are wearing our masks. We have had zero um, transmission of infection from child to healthcare worker in our institution. And the children, like I said, are you know, pretty much not wearing masks at all. So I just wanted to put that out there. I hope that that provides a little bit of, um, you know, reassurance. Would you recommend students quarantine after leaving the school for symptoms one day and wanting to return to school the next day? So, if a child has symptoms that are that are um, concerning for COVID-19, they need to follow up with their primary care doctor, um, whatever that looks like, um, in terms of in-person versus telehealth visit, and um, determine whether or not they may have an alternate diagnosis, as we've, you know, discussed up here. Versus, yes, this is concerning for COVID-19 and what we need to do. Um, just just a quick clarification on terms: if you have symptoms, then you are at, then you are isolated at home for that period of ten days. If you are exposed, that's when quarantine quarantine comes into play. Should singing be avoided in classrooms where students are too young preschool to wear masks? What we're doing in Shawnee Mission is um, doing singing outdoors when possible uh, with a lot of social distancing, you know, 10, 15 feet if we can. And then when it, we can't go outdoors, uh, using our large multi-purpose rooms, our large cafeteria spaces, auditoriums, things like that where the kids can still get, be that 10 to 15 feet apart. Because so much research around children was done when children were being kept home more, it seems reasonable to take that data with a grain of salt. Without more data around how much children, how can we responsibly move forward with school reopening and sports after school activities? Isn't it more reasonable to reopen very slowly to watch for a rise in cases? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So. Um, what we know around the world is multiple countries have been able to open up their schools and have schools in per class in person um, for kids of all ages and have done well. That said, 
by and large, those countries had a very low community transmission, right? So they were much lower than where we are in Kansas and Missouri at around nine and a half per, or nine and a half percent. So, you know, that's, there's the caveat there, right? So to me, what's really important right now is that we drive down our community transmission rate. We need to be very focused on that as an entire, you know, Kansas City community. Um, but the good news is, is that other countries have shown that this is doable, and when they did that, they didn't have a huge spike in cases. In some countries, like the Netherlands, they're not even social distancing or having kids wear masks at all. So, so you're right, we don't have all of the pieces and all of the data, but but we can we can learn from other countries around the world. We can see what's going on, and that is really helpful. In Israel, when they when they did you know open up, and then they shut down pretty quickly after they had their second case, they had a couple of things against them. They had a they had a little bit of a higher transmission rate in the community. They had a heat wave, so they didn't make people wear, they didn't make the kids wear masks, and they had overcrowding in their schools. And they were, they, you know, they were upfront about it. So actually three things against them that caused them to kind of have this early bit of, oh, 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 maybe this wasn't the right thing to do, and then shut down. So again, we can learn from all these other countries and what they've done and try to hopefully glean from that um, to, for us to move forward. MSHSAA has a COVID-19 return to play form. It was mentioned that it is because of a cardiac complication that could be associated with COVID. If they don't test, is this something that we have to be worried about? Why do they, um, why do they this, this form that needs to be filled out by AHCP? Why do they need this form or? submit that question to the school portal and then we can have our sports, um, sports yeah, management team mm -hmm. look at that one. Are any schools using an app for parents to fill out, take temperatures, Kinza information is then reported to the school by class so that trends can be followed? That's funny, I just emailed out to, uh, that to my team of nurses yesterday. Is there an app or something we could use for daily self-assessments that it would data dump for us? Um, I'm not aware uh, of anything. I mean, I'm thinking somehow someone could create a QR code where you know you fill in the blanks and then that's all data dumped, but um, so far I don't know of any. Well, we have one at Children's Mercy that I use today, so I don't know if we can pass along that information or if it data dumps or what it does. Yeah, we use, the, we use red cap. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and question for Shelby, what will the school nurse morning rounds entail? What I'm hoping is that when the um, teachers do the thumbs up, thumbs down, this is more for elementary, that if anyone gives a thumbs down, that they're not feeling great, or if the teacher visually, as she inspects each kiddo's faces, if she's concerned, maybe someone has their head down on the desk, maybe someone's crying, you know, um, they're just not acting themselves, that the teacher will email those kids and that the nurse will have that list from each teacher and she'll um, physically go through each classroom. Maybe she'll have a cart with all of her assessment equipment with her. She'll check temps, um, you know, talk to the kiddos. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like morning rounds that you do in the hospital. With contact tracing, the household contact has recommendations of 14 days after 24 hours after symptoms of the symptomatic person, as well as some other recommendations. Okay, so for, for quarantine, the recommendation is 14 days from, from, from your exposure to the person who, who developed symptoms or had a positive test if they didn't have any symptoms, let's say. For symptomatic people, the recommendation is home isolation for 10 days and an additional 24 hours of um, being afebrile with symptom improvement. 
we're going to need to wrap up because our technology will be shutting off at noon. And so I wanted to real quickly do some closing thing uh, announcements. Number one, thank you to all our speakers, including our two that came before. But if you do have a question still that needs answered, you feel uncomfortable that you didn't get your question answered, please send that in through the assistance form and we will route it to the right folks to answer your question. Um, I want to also thank Darren and PJ, who are AV specialists, that it, this would not have happened without them. Again, for Athanas, for her collaboration on planning. I do want to reiterate a few things, is that please go to the school health support site on the Children's Mercy website for some of those other answers, like the guidance for reopening, and also that th to look at the f area for school nurses, the school health conference school nurse area. We will have all of the recordings of the of the presentations as well as a PDF format of the slides so people can use those. But there'll also be these other additional resource links and re uh, links to other resources on our website that you guys will want to uh, check in on very often. Please be sure that you completed the attendance form. Also, be sure that I will send out the evaluation on Monday and you can be watching for that and please complete it by August 21st. Be sure when you do that evaluation, put in all the data related to your name and your credentials because that will populate your CNE form that you can print off at the end of the program. Um, lastly, um, if you have other types of training or other types of events that you need assistance with related to Children's Mercy, knowing in COVID, we're all wondering how some of those things can happen, but be able to, to ask for that assistance, you can do that through the community outreach portal. Lastly, if there's any questions related to just the education portion of this or any other uh, online vir uh, virtual trainings related to school health, you can email that to me or to Athenis, and we will follow up on that just to see if there's something planned in the future. So other than that, I'd like to thank everybody again. Have a um, great school year, no matter what format it looks like, knowing um, uh, that we'll be thinking of all of you um, throughout this time as you reopen, because I know school nurses are in the center of all of this. Um, they're working with the teachers, they're working with the administrators, they're working with the children and the families. So we'll be thinking of you, and we are here as far as Children's Mercy for resources. Be sure and ask for that through that assistance program if you need those questions answered. So thank you, take care, and have a great day.